All right, what's up? We're doing a daytime stream. We don't usually do daytime streams, but today it just felt right, and it, and it just felt like, you know, I just felt some type of way. So I felt like we we gotta had to do this some some type of way. Uh, I got my. Uh, triadic shot of espresso over here. I got a triple shot, a triadic shot of espresso, <clears throat> espresso, as some might say. We got already some uh, generous super chatters. Thank you guys. We'll get to you guys in a minute. <clears throat> as you guys know, the way this works in open forum, you can bring up <coughs> whatever questions, topics that you want. <coughs> I'm always coughing in here still because. <coughs> The allergies are still nuts, man. It's like I'm over the sickness, but Pollen Boy is on the attack. So pa Pollen Boy's got... <coughs> he's got uh, Spruce Boy. He's got Juniper Boy. And some other damn Holly or some other kind of tree bitch coming after me. So that's why I'm still coughing. It's like a, it's like a level nine. Defcon five <clears throat> today for for pollen. So I'm gonna try my best. As you know, the way it works is you request to speak on Twitter. The link is in the chat. It's in the show description. How do I call in? How do I call in? How do I call in? Twitter. When you request to speak you will be automatically muted. That's how Twitter works. When you come on, however, when I say you, that means you, and then you have to unmute yourself. So even though I'm going to have to say unmute, dude, 500 times, if you already know to unmute, then we could avoid that. But we all know it's never going to be avoided. So it's just going to be like, <clears throat> like, you know, catchphrase, you know, com comedians have those cringy catchphrases. Here's your sign. <laughs> Tater salad, tater salad, here's your sign. You might be reading it. If you can't hit the unmute button, you might be a Protestant. Right. Well, my catchphrase is just going to be unmute, dude. Unmute, dude. <laughs> just unmute, man. Make it easy. But look, nobody's going to make it easy. And nobody... Except one in ten is actually going to present an argument. <clears throat> Remember, arguments are not assertions and claims. That might be your position, asserting your position. And then you give evidences or you give propositions or you give arguments that support the assertion or the claim. Just machine gunning a bunch of your positions out isn't an argument. For example, in the Jake debate, Jake Machine Gun spat out his position of what Tawheed was, but never gave an argument for why we should accept that in his opening statement that that's what God's unity is. I argue that we have two competing systems giving competing accounts of unity and diversity within God. And I ain't talking about a diversity quota, okay? We ain't talking about diverse. We talking about affirmative action inside the deity, okay? That's not what we talking about. Just multiplicity, distinctions. Unity and difference in God. But what we heard was a lot of uh, almost rapping, this is my position, this is my position, this is my position. <clears throat> no, not arguments. Uh, I want to hit on a couple things before we open it up because usually I find that a little bit of opening rant kind of helps set the, the, the tone, the stage for today's show. And of course, you can call in not just on Islam, but you can call in on the topics listed in the show description or in the Twitter space description. And, and without fail, people will join and say and be mad that it's a debate. Why are you trying to debate me? Because it's titled as a debate. You, If you hop on a stream called debate, don't be upset that you're engaging in a debate. 
It's titled that. You you hopped in the very strip and then played the victim. Oh, he's mean. Oh, he's mean. No, you just didn't read. The topics are existence of God, metaphysics, Trinity, Arianism, Nestorianism, church history, councils, papacy, Vatican I, Vatican II, medieval church, metaphysics in the Middle Ages, Trinity, Tawhid, the debates, the Muslim debates. Some Muslims said, You're, you chose Jake because he's not a good Muslim. That's like the fifth Muslim. How many Muslim? This is what they always do. Like it doesn't matter. You can you can debate infinite Muslims, and they will always say you did not debate the real Muslim, not real Muslim. <clears throat> so it's infinity Muslims until there's like the 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 Godfoot. I got to just debate the Godfoot itself before I actually have debated an actual true Islamic scholar. <clears throat> You can talk about logos, logi. You can talk about tag, presup, transcendental arguments. We can talk about epistemology, atheism, materialism. All of those are on the table. If you have questions, yes, you can also ask your questions. However, <clears throat> we like to give people who disagree the front of the line. So if you just have 15 orthodox questions about fasting and FAQs, go ask your priest about that. Don't ask me your FAQs about whether you can uh, listen to uh, Stone Temple Pilots CDs, okay? Don't ask me if you can do whatever moral thing you don't know about. Today's stream is not about that, and I'm not your advisor. <clears throat> I'm a kind of a, a, a fool character, an internet fool character who can uh, demonstrate that even as a fool character, the fool archetype, even the fool can make bad arguments look as bad as they are. You see what I'm trying to say. So I'm not your guru. I'm not your guru. I'm not your spiritual daddy. I'm just your philosophical daddy. <laughs> Anyway, let's get into a little bit of what Redeem Zoomer, who seems to have spiraled out of control since our debate. <clears throat> For whatever reason, uh, he posted that he was freaking out that people in his Discord were converting to Orthodoxy. And he was going to ban talking about Orthodox stuff because so many people in his Discord were starting to look into Orthodoxy. Uh, <clears throat> it doesn't seem like since our discussion, he's engaged in any attempts to better understand our positions. It seems like he's in damage control mode and flipping out constantly. And he does the thing where um, he'll say a bunch of stuff about you personally and then apologize. And then he'll go, so just keep it to the issues, okay? I never said anything about him personally. Um, so if you respond to this, just keep it to the issues because I'm not... I, ne I never said anything about you as an individual. <clears throat> Jay is a guru name. Jay, uh, it does sound kind of... Um, it does sound kind of like a Hinduish name or something, right? <laughs> uh, let's see. <coughs> what is... Uh, where does... Re Redeem Zoomer... Mastering Reform Theology... Well, does Redeem Zimmer actually have a master's in theology? What? Why would we think that he can teach us uh, master level stuff in theology as, what is he, like 21? As you, but despite the differences between Catholics and Protestants, they're a lot closer to each other than they are to Eastern Orthodoxy. The biggest split in Christianity was not the Protestant Reformation. It was the great schism between... <laughs> Protestants and Roman Catholics are closer to each other? I'm not sure about that. I mean, I guess it just depends on which doctrine we pick. So I'm assuming he's going to pick original sin. In Western and Eastern Christianity, here's why we Reformed Protestants side with the West. What the heck kind of music is this? I feel like I'm at uh, Santa's village and I'm supposed to, what are we picking up? Freaking, it's a year-round Santa's village where I'm picking up ornaments. <laughs> what kind of... 
weird keyboard, like boomer keyboard Casio songs is he playing? Eastern Orthodoxy is a beautiful tradition that we can all be inspired by, but the reason we don't agree with them is because Eastern theology denies a lot of things that the Bible teaches. So we're going to have the old word, word concept fallacy that uh, even though we all agree that the texts have to be interpreted, uh, I'm just going to say that the words mean what they say and they say what they mean. So this is a common mistake that we see Muslims, Roman Catholics, Protestants, and even some Orthodox engage in, which is just the, the basic idea that there's a plain, simple meaning of all texts and that... Other traditions get, quote, too philosophical, and they don't stick to the plain perspicuity meaning of the text. But are texts perspicuous? Do they actually possess perspic perspicacity? <laughs> Do they possess viscosity breakdown? No. Uh, it I mean, you could say within a book that it's possible that certain texts are clearer than other texts. Certainly within the Bible, certain texts are clearer than other texts, but that's partly going to depend on who's reading it and what their education level is, what their background is, <clears throat> what they do and don't know, how familiar they are with the rest of the book. So even saying, even admitting that certain areas of the Bible might be clearer than other areas still doesn't itself tell us to each individual which area will be clearer. In other words, something that an educated person thinks is um, pretty obvious, might not be obvious to an edu uneducated person. Maybe they're reading about, uh, you know, uh, through the eye of a needle or something like that, right? And you don't know this uh, rhetorical idiom or whatever. You don't know this hyperbole. Okay, well, if you're an uneducated person, that might be totally ambiguous to you. An educated person might think, well, this is obviously hyperbole. So you see that even when we say, or even if we admit that there are, quote, clearer passages, <clears throat> it doesn't itself tell us which passages are themselves universally clear or unclear. So a lot of times Protestants, and we notice the same thing with Muslims, it's the exact move that Jake did. They have a very naive epistemology and a naive linguistic theory or semiotic view that the texts just mean what they say and they say what they mean. And that typically goes along with word concept fallacy. People who have that one dimensional view of language and texts typically fall into the mistake, as I'm sure we're going to see with Redeem Zoomer, of thinking that <clears throat> the word that's used always has the same meaning in the same context and the same referent. So for example, logos as it's used by the, this is a common Roman Catholic word concept fallacy. Well, Marcus Aurelius says logos. John 1 says logos. So they mean and refer to the exact same thing. <clears throat> maybe they do, maybe they don't. Just because the word is used, we need to know the intentional context and the lexical context and the entire book's context and perhaps even the entire religion's context. So you see that Individual words are situated within broader context. The sentence, the paragraph, the chapter, the book, the book as a whole, as in the case of the Bible, because it's books within books, and then the tradition as a whole, perhaps. So, for example, I can't take um, a word that is exterior to the Orthodox tradition or to the biblical tradition, <clears throat> find that word in, say, Greek philosophy or Platonism, and then interpret that word within the Christian context as having a one-to-one -one meaning with the Greek term. This happens a lot, for example, with nous. Well, the, the Greek philosophers use the word nous. When you Orthodox use it, that must mean the same thing. So it's just purely the intellect or some higher faculty of the intellect, according to, say, Greek philosophers. <clears throat> it's not what it means in Orthodox. It, it corresponds to the Hebrew idea of the heart which is not the intellect. So you see that with whether it's noose or whether it's logos, these are just examples. But the same type of mistake can happen <clears throat> when we're looking at even English texts or English words, like person. Does person mean just an individual nature? Does it mean something distinct from nature? How we 
understand person and nature, for example, will have tremendous implications on our view of the Trinity and our view of Christology. <clears throat> so a big part of this mistake and a big part of this really rookie sophomore understanding <clears throat> that a lot of internet people engage in, <clears throat> very common amongst Protestants and Muslims, somewhat common amongst Roman Catholics as well, but maybe less Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics tend to be, if they're into these topics, a little more educated than the average Muslim or the average <clears throat> Protestant. So they can sometimes avoid some of this issue. But <clears throat> as St. Basil says, pretty much every heretic is making some kind of linguistic mistake, usually, right? And he's speaking in that case of uh, Eunomius and the Eunomian heresy. I'm kind of giving the idea of ingeneracy or ungenerate, ingenerate, basically identifying that with the divine essence. And so therefore anything that's not ingenerate or ungenerated is therefore not God or less than God. Hence the son, since he is not ingenerate and he is generate or has an origin or he is not unoriginate, then he must not be God. That's the eunomian premise or the, you know, that's the a version of the eunomian argument. And so <clears throat> Basil argues against this, as the rest of the Cappadocians do, that not every word is referring to or picking out the same thing, right? Think about how many times we've made this argument with the, the phrase like Dr. Branson does, God, G-O-D. Okay, God can pick out different things. And many, many Muslims since the Jake debate have already been saying, oh, oh, you lost the debate when you said you believed in little G, three little G gods. And the argument there is just missing the whole point that this is a linguistic distinction between <clears throat> what God can pick out as in uh, distinct persons, divine nature. And so one, the one true God, the one God, capital G, typically is picking out the person of the Father, at least in the patristic period, that's always what it is. And that's why the Nicene Creed is a monarchical Trinitarian doctrine. It says, I believe in one God, the Father. All the Cappadocians speak this way. So, <clears throat> little g God then refers to God from God. Did you notice the Nicene Creed says God from God, light from light? Okay, so that's a distinction within unity. That's the way that we account for distinction within unity. Of course, Muslims, for example, whatever their position, whether they're a Shari or uh uh, Salafi or whether they're <clears throat> whatever Athari uh, the different Muslim positions, Neoplatonist, Shia <clears throat> they're all going to have different ways and attempts of accounting for unity and distinction in God so that's why I typically frame the debate with the Muslims as it's not a debate between uh, who's got the unity position and who's the polytheist it's two different positions giving an account for unity and multiplicity. And that's why the counting issue is so important there because both Muslims and Christians, when they're accounting for unity and distinction in God, are going to count by division and by uh, identity. And if you didn't notice, when the creed, for example, says undivided, God is undivided, that's counting by division. When Al-Ghazali, in his... Uh, 10th proposition in the moderation of belief book talks about being God being undivided. He's counting by division. Aristotle in category six metaphysics. I think it's around book 10 in metaphysics counting by division. Now <clears throat> I didn't say in the ancient and medieval world, they only counted by division. That was a mistake that Jake, Jake assumed that because I said they counted by division, I said they only counted by division. No, I said, First order, second order in position. Two different types of things, even in the medieval philosophers, that were counted in different ways. So it would have actually behooved Jake to be familiar with some of the responses to the argument that we only count by identity. Because he just assumed that I was saying, no, we only count by division, which I didn't say. I said, we count in both ways. And then he set up a false either or which he didn't realize would trap his own position. That if he's going to count the attributes by identity, then he's got multiple necessary attributes, which is a makes his position polytheist. So 
There you go. A thousand years ago, Christianity split in half when the Patriarch of the East got kicked out of the church by the Pope. Now, a lot of this was political, but it was also theological, meaning it has to do with what we think about God. Even though Catholics and Protestants disagree on a lot, they have the exact same view of God. The Eastern view is slightly different. There's really six main issues they disagree on, which can be abbreviated with the acronym FROST. FROST? And all- Okay, well this is an interesting, unique approach to this question. Let's see, what is- What do we disagree on? Filioque reason. Um, maybe. Original sin, probably. Simplicity, yes. Theosis, sacrifice. Well, the Roman Catholic and the Protestant view of sacrifice are not the same, so I don't know where he's going to... I don't know if he thinks he's going to find commonality with Roman Catholics on, quote, sacrifice. All of these issues are connected to each other. For each of these issues, there's a Western view and an Eastern view, and the Western view of all these issues is the biblical one. The biggest... Okay, yeah. Good one. Good argument there. Just assert that the, quote, West is right on all of these issues and the East is wrong. Uh, I'm sure he's going to give some kind of argument, but... <clears throat> Uh, I'm not sure that you, I'm not sure that actually this is, I mean, Roman Catholics on the Filioque, I mean, they have a lot more of a nuanced position, but this is kind of assuming that Reformed and Protestants themselves have a unified position. Where does he get the idea that, quote, Protestantism is a unified position on any of these issues at all? There's no Protestant unity. Maybe you could say there's unity on like a couple super generic positions like we follow the Bible over tradition. Okay, maybe that's one of the, quote, unifying things of Protestants. Um, Roman Catholics and Protestants don't have the same view of sacrifice. Uh, I don't know what he thinks the Western view of theosis is that's different from... I mean, do Protestants don't even teach theosis, <laughs> so I don't... I mean, this is, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm predicting this is going to all be a bunch of word concept outs. Disagreement is the filioque. As we said in the first video, all Christians believe in the Trinity, which is that the three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all God, which means they all have everything that makes God God. So he doesn't even know what monarchical Trinitarianism is. He doesn't even know that that's the, the view that's established at the Second Ecumenical Council, which is the official church's trinity council so he didn't even know that <clears throat> but if they all have the same uh, i think i brought all this up in our debate by the way in properties then what makes them different from each other the three person hey jamie could you make me a coffee <clears throat> could you put a little manuka honey in it thank you i got a, co a cup in here are only different from each other in their relations to each other so what are these yeah and so if they're only different by relation then the thing that makes them distinct isn't anything unique and so this is one of the critiques that Lasky has of Western Trinitarianism, so-called, which is that a person reduces to a relation. But Eastern theology is premised on the idea that persona, is, uh, persona at relatio is false. Person cannot be identified with a relation. Person is subject or agent. And, <clears throat> and I, I brought this up in our debate, and he was completely lost, by the way. So... None of what I said apparently stuck in, uh, uh, sunk in from our debate, and he's just sort of look at what is all this. It looks like a freaking uh, football team's. Uh, you know, he, what, is he like Rudy over here? He's drawing the the plays of the West. Uh, you know, like I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, I hate football movies, but the Rudy is the only one I can even think of that I've ever even watched. Right. So he's over here like Rudy trying to trying to rally his team drawing drawing the Trinity and the Philadelphia some kind of confusing ass gibberish uh, football play eternal scenario relations. Here. According to the West, the Son is eternally generated from the Father and the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son or filioque in Latin. Notice we haven't had any, so far he's just saying positions, no arguments yet. But according to the East, the Holy Spirit only proceeds from the Father and not the Son. The first question should be, what does the Bible say? The Bible very clearly says the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of the Father, is also the Spirit of the Son. Or so, level one mistakes. He doesn't understand the difference between economia and theology proper, or the intertrinitarian life versus the economia. So, not doesn't even know that. Not even a level one understanding of what the filioque issue is. The Spirit of Christ. Many, many times it says the Holy Spirit is from the Son or of the Son. Yeah, nobody in the Orthodox Church disagrees with that. That was never even part of the debate. 
That should settle it. But still, the East... He, I mean, literally doesn't even know the issue. ...uses the West of adding the filioque to the Nicene Creed when it wasn't there before. And this... Uh, we don't accuse the West of doing it. The West admits to doing it, and Pope Leo III forbade it from being added. So that's, again, he doesn't even know basic history. This is technically true, but it kind of doesn't matter because neither of them use the original version of the Nicene Creed. Yeah, but the argument isn't that we only follow the Creed as it's produced at Nicaea. The argument is that Constantinopolitan Creed, <clears throat> the, the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed, is forbidden at Ephesus from being added to. So the clause that you, and then Chalcedon, right? So Ephesus and Chalcedon are the ones that say that you can't alter the creed. It's not Nicaea 1 that says the, the creed can't be changed. So this is misunderstanding. This is an old, a stupid old argument that Nabara made uh, that he, he didn't even realize that it's not Nicaea that forbids the change. The change is <clears throat> forbidden after it's already been changed. Which didn't have the paragraph about the Holy Spirit. All of this is like level, literally level 101 mistakes. So both of them use an updated version, it's just that the Western version is slightly more updated. And just because the original creed didn't have the filioque doesn't mean people didn't believe in the filioque back then. Actually it does, because number one, he doesn't even understand what the issue is. It's about the hypostatic properties and whether the Father is the sole cause. Hence, monarchical Trinitarianism as taught by the Cappadocians. <clears throat> and whether or not the hypostatic property of the Father can be uh, shared, given to, or in any way participated in by the sun. That's the issue. Especially because so many of the most important people that we talked about in the previous videos did believe in it. Some of the greatest defenders of true teaching, like St. Athanasius. St. Saint... Athanasius doesn't believe in the filioque. Uh, this is easily debunked in uh, Sashensky's book. Uh, really, the only there's one quote in Ambrose that could be read as filioque, and then St. Augustine. So for the West, that's it. <clears throat> we did a whole uh, live stream with Dr. Branson, who did his dissertation on the Cappadocians. And uh, there's one phrase in uh, Nyssa's against Eunomius that's used uh, as a proof text. But as Dr. Branson points out, that one phrase in against Eunomius goes against the, th the rest of the thrust of the text. And because it's an ambiguous passage, it makes more sense to interpret the one phrase in Nyssa's text uh, in harmony with the rest of the texts that are a lot clearer, where he specifies that there's there's only one sole cause, and that is the hypostasis of the Father. It's not the divine nature. So you can refer back to the three-hour live stream that we did, going through the entire Sashinsky book on the Filioque, which is the most up-to-date academic text on it from a person who was Roman Catholic and became Orthodox. And you can also go watch the recent Dr. Branson stream that we did where we dove deep into these topics as well, leaving essentially no argumentation for the filioque other than uh, Augustine. That's it. The spirit is from the sun. By the way, we don't go by one guy. So per perfectly uh, Protestant mindset that, oh, where do I get my canon? Uh, I'll pick Jerome, one guy. Where do I get my uh, Trinity do doctrine? Uh, I'll Augustine, one guy. Yeah, it's the... The, the Constantinopolitan Council, the Second Ecumenical Council, that trumps any single dude. The way the Son is from the Father, or St. Cyril of Alexandria explicitly saying the Holy Spirit perceives. Yeah, if you read the rest of Cyril and if you read the treatment that Sashinsky says, that this is not what he's talking about. Uh, the, he's, the procession is what he's talking about. Just because the word proceeds is used, that just means come forth. So it's not always in the, the English translation, identical to hypostatic origin. So we agree that the manifestation of the spirit and the energies is through the sun. Right? And that's taught by Gregor of Cyprus. That's at the, uh, uh, the later Palamite synods. Uh, you could read Crisis in Byzantium by Papadakis on that. But just because you see the word uh, proceeds, you notice that he did the same thing with the biblical text, right? Comes from the sun. Yeah, but in what sense? Comes from the sun in terms of manifestation? A proceeding forth through manifestation or a proceeding forth as hypostatic origin. You see, those are two different things. Proceeds from the Father and the Son. Or Pope Leo also saying the Spirit proceeds from the Father and he's saying the Holy Spirit... By the way, if you notice that text right there, the Holy Spirit, when he is in us, right, comes from Father and Son, that's economia. So even the even the text that he's got right there is an economic relation and not a hypostat an internal hypostatic origin relation. Proceeds from the Father and the Son. Or Pope Leo also saying the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Yeah, this is also dealt with in uh, 
the Sashinsky book. So this is why it doesn't work to do quote mines to prove this kind of stuff. Uh, it's basically just ignoring all of the scholarship that explains to you the difference between hypostatic origin and manifestation, which is necessary to have a coherent doctrine of the Trinity, by the way. Roman Catholics typically don't even know this or understand this, unless they happen to be kind of uh, brainiac uniates. Really, brainiac uniates are the only ones that are even kind of aware of this. <clears throat> But it's actually brought up, by the way, in the uh, Vatican clarification on the filioque. Both sides recognize these people as the heroes of the early church. Now, the East responds to this by saying the Bible and the church fathers are only talking about energetic procession, not hypostatic procession. Uh, no, actually, uh, uh, I, you, you, you already confused economia with uh, intra-Trinitarian life and origin. So... We don't just say that it's that. So you misunderstood that. Partly because they think there's a difference between God's essence and God's energies, but that creates a whole... Yeah, that actually comes from the Bible, right? So Paul makes this distinction when he talks about the energies of the Spirit, right? We have this when we, talk, when we, we, we read about the seven spirits of God. Okay, do you think God's knowledge, God's wisdom, etc., are they creatures or are they really distinct things? I'm pretty sure foreknowledge is different from the divine essence. I'm pretty sure the act of creating is different from the act of destroying the world. New set of problems that we're going to talk about later. Also in the Eastern view, you can't really tell what the difference between the Son and the Spirit is because they're both just from the Father. Yeah, maybe you should read the Cappadocians who actually address that eunomian argument directly because eunomius, uh, again, he was talking about reducing uh, hypostatic properties to essence. And Basil's response is that that there is a distinction between uh, procession and generation we know what the distinction is we do not know that's a Cappadocian quote those are the guys who gave us the doctrine of the trinity at the second ecumenical council so this guy has no knowledge of any of this they'll say the difference is because the son is from He's the not even aware of the basics father by begetting and the spirit by procession and if you ask what the difference between those two things are they'll say we know there is a difference but it's a mystery yeah, that's what the basil's difference. quote there is the Speak. guy who's like the daddy of the trinity next to athanasius and the other Cappadocians. right so he doesn't even know he's like what he's arguing against is what Basil says. Speaking of mystery, another thing they disagree on is reason. The Bible calls Christ the Logos, or the wisdom, of God. Both sides agree on that. Both sides also agree that all Christians have the Holy Spirit. But because the West believes the Holy Spirit proceeds from Christ, therefore proceeds from the wisdom of God, that implies that Christians have access to the wisdom of God and therefore can gain knowledge of God. This is why Western Christianity is more into. Okay, I don't, this, that makes no sense. So he thinks that <laughs> because Christ is the Logos, that this somehow translates to the human. He doesn't even know what like faculties are. Like He doesn't know that reason can be spoken of as a faculty that we possess as part of our human nature, and that the divine mind uh, possesses reason as well, uh, the Church Fathers argue. So he's equivocating on reason as if this is somehow necessary and connected to filioque uh literally no idea what he's this is a ridiculous sorry i've never heard this makes no sense it's just equivocating on terms that implies that christians have access to the wisdom of god and therefore can gain knowledge of god this is why western christianity is more intellectual and eastern christianity is more yeah but it's not though and if you read saint gregory palamas the point of intellect and concepts is fine as far as it goes but god is not in your intellect and god is not your concept god is beyond all intellect and concepts and so the direct experience of god transcends the creaturely things that doesn't mean the creaturely things are bad it just means that they're limited in the west you get this idealization and uh, idolatry of intellect and ideas because they actually identify the soul with the intellect so again i don't even think i don't think he really understands what he doesn't know the difference between reasoning as a faculty reasoning as an action or a function and what it even means to call reason a a property or a faculty of nature mystical because they have different views of reason this is not an insult prominent orthodox priests will agree with this right after the fact that reasoning can lead us away from God does not mean that reasoning is bad or that we're anti-intellectual. So this is uh, another straw man, uh, as if because Father Josiah Trendum is talking about rationalism that that he does. So does Redeem Zimmer not the, know the difference between reason as a faculty or a function and rationalism as an intellectual movement of the Enlightenment? 
Uh, no, he doesn't even know that. The split, the West started doing scholasticism, which is where they study theology academically and try to learn the mysteries about God. Saint Anselm was one of the most important Western saints right after the split, and he started medieval scholasticism. He said that theology... It's not actually started by Anselm, it's actually Augustine and Boethius, but uh, the problem is not... He, so there's another word concept fallacy, like... The problem is not being scholastic. The problem is scholasticism, which is built on a bunch of faulty presuppositions. So another word concept fallacy that he doesn't know the difference. He doesn't know the difference between reason and rationalism. He doesn't know the difference between being scholastic and scholasticism. Because if he were, were to read the medieval Byzantine theologians, uh, they were super scholastic. His faith seeking understanding, and he started to find out new ways to prove that God exists. The medieval scholastics spent centuries trying to figure out everything, like how do we define what God is? Anselm says God is the thing you can't think of anything greater than. Thomas Aquinas says God is pure being. Duns Scotus says God is the infinite. And these ideas don't necessarily contradict each other, and Reformed theology was greatly... I don't understand why, why he's... Uh apt to point out people that he thinks are actually heretics. I mean, these are people that, number one, reject him and totally think he's heretical. <clears throat> he thinks these people are heretical. But uh, leave it to the reform to be inconsistent and roll these people out when they think they're useful for uh, optics reasons. Influenced by these theologians. All these people thought the filioque way is necessary for understanding God. So what? Uh, we also don't think that those people are saints in our church so what what would this have to do with uh disproving the the orthodox position unless you're just trying to score points on the ideas that there's a generic western theology of god that's correct do you think that john calvin's theology is anywhere close to thomas aquinas do you think that anselm's theology is anywhere close to i don't know um uh zwingli I mean, give me a break, right? So this is all optics and like ignoring the big issues that these people killed each other. They're not in agreement, literally. Protestants killed themselves amongst other Protestants over baptism. Roman Catholics killed Protestants, obviously. So this idea that there's a generic commonality between them that he could somehow utilize against Orthodox theology is just like super low tier. And studying God led to studying God's creation by doing science. That's why it was the Western Church that created modern science, modern universities, classical music, and... Actually, universities come out of Byzantium, okay? It's not a creation of the West. So, uh, ignorant of Byzantium, um, modern science, I don't mean modern scientism. I mean, that seems like a double-edged sword there, so <laughs> I'm not sure. But to attribute this to... Uh, I mean, is this admitting then that Roman Catholicism is the real source? I mean, if he's going to argue that Western, that all this Western stuff comes uh, out of the Middle Ages, then this is actually undercutting his dumb reform position. So, uh-oh, looks like modern science universities come out of Rome uh, and not the Protestant world. So that's actually an own against himself. And by the way, universities come out of Byzantium. Uh, not uh, whatever he thinks they come out of. Western civilization itself, the most successful civilization to ever exist. Well, how do you measure success, right? I mean, is the is success of Western civilization, quote unquote, measured by bodily comforts? Is it measured by uh, nuclear weapons? Is it measured by uh, how apostate and atheist it is now? So you see how arbitrary and ridiculous this kind of argumentation is. And we're back with my... Uh, so this video is not very long and we'll be done with this in a second and then I'll have one little clip and then we'll open it up to you guys. Now again, today's topics are whatever you want to talk about uh, in terms of the, the things listed. So don't start talking about uh, Middle Eastern politics because that's not the topic today. Uh, if you start talking about uh, Tiny Mustache Man, I'm immediately going to boot you. If you start talking about um, uh, weird conspiracy crap, uh, you're going to get booted immediately because none of those things are the topic. Also, uh, today we're talking to people who disagree. So those go to the head of the line. If you got 20 questions for me about what you're supposed to do in your fasting rule, that's, that's not for me. I'm not going to answer your fasting question. This is not a, uh, it's a debate. Okay. That means actual debate. So if you hop on here and whine and cry, 
because you hopped on a debate stream, it's not going to work. Nobody's going to buy into that. And they're not going to believe you're a victim and you're oppressed because you came on a stream that you didn't actually read the title for. Western theology is whether they like Augustine, who was one of the most important Augustine. early church fathers, and it shouldn't surprise you that he very strongly believed in the filioque. He also... Yeah, but nobody, uh, not even you as a Protestant, follows one dude, right? I mean, nobody consistently follows one dude. Now, the Roman Catholic Church supposedly follows one dude, a.k.a. Francis, but they don't consistently do that, as we'll see here in a second. You don't follow one dude. So when you try to find uh, evidence for your positions in the church fathers, it's completely arbitrary. Oh, I want the canon that Jerome has. Oh, I want the theology of Jesus that Athanasius has. And then you think the rest of his beliefs are heretical. By the way, no uh, Roman Catholic person would ever uh, accept your belief that Augustine is a Protestant. Have you read Augustine? I don't just mean your quote minds. I mean, I've read thousands of pages of Augustine. He was a Catholic bishop. Now, for us, we think that individual theologians can make mistakes. Gregory of Nyssa made mistakes. St. Maximus made mistakes. Augustine made mistakes. Tertullian made mistakes. Some mistakes can be so severe that eventually the church determines that you're outside the church, like in the case of Tertullian. He left the church, right? You could argue that Justin Martyr made a mistake in the way he phrased things here and there, sure. But he could also be read in an orthodox way. And I want to remind everybody, too, that... Uh, uh, IP, Inspiring Philosophy, is doing a stream later uh, addressing one of Jake's claims about uh, Tertullian being not a Trinitarian. Uh, Sam Shamoon also addressed this. It's, it's, it's a dumb argument. It's, not, it's actually missing the whole point. Um, but anyway, let's get back to this. Believed in original sin, which says that because of the fall, all of us are dead in sin from the moment of conception. Our default state is guilty before God. That means... Now, I guess... Uh, Redeem Zoomer is not even aware of the Roman Catholic position is not the Augustinian position. Does he not know this? And you could go read the, for example, well, you'd read the Catholic Catechism <clears throat> where it makes a distinction between uh, original guilt and actual guilt. Roman Catholics no longer affirm original guilt. Infants are not guilty because of Adam's sin. So that's actually something that we agree with in terms of Rome and the Orthodox. Now, at the time of Augustine, up until Gregory the Great, the West did believe that infants were guilty and that all men were guilty in Adam as in an archetype. And that's the, that's the argumentation that Augustine uses in uh, City of God, for example, in one place where he makes this argument. And so he has a Neoplatonic idea that everyone is guilty because we're all impotentia in Adam as in an archetype. And so we are all already guilty because we exist impotentia in him. Uh, eventually, when the Roman Catholic Church defines and explains the doctrine of infant limbo, this is precisely to get around the fact that infants are not guilty of Adam's sin itself. <clears throat> so, actually, Rome eventually softens their position and moves away from original guilt. Now, you could argue that Roman Catholic Church is inconsistent, which I do argue that in my uh, essay against Taylor Marshall on this position. But the modern-day Roman Catholic Church does not agree with the Reformed Calvinist position that infants are automatically damned merely by being children of Adam. So the only people today that still hold to the Augustinian position are Calvinists. So if he wants to claim Augustine, he could claim him just in that specific area, <laughs> and maybe on uh, absolute predestination. <clears throat> but... He doesn't even know that the Roman Catholic position is not his position on inherited guilt. From the moment we were conceived, we deserve to go to hell. It's not a pretty truth, but it's what the Bible teaches. And it doesn't teach that. That's your misinterpretation. And uh, Meyendorf has a, a good essay uh, pointing out where, because Augustine didn't know the Greek, he misunderstood Romans 5. It's very important to recognize how serious sin... By the way, if you want to go deeper into that, I have an entire three-hour discussion from Augustine proving all these points, okay? So I'm sure a lot of people are going to be like, no, oh, 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 no, look, I will, I will walk you through uh, Augustine's errors and his texts in great detail in this uh, open Q&A that we did right here. It's called Augustine, Calvin, Original Sin, and Orthodox Theology. So you can go watch this stream. I'll put it in the chat right here. And this addresses in detail the basic 
mistakes and fundamental errors that reform zoomer is not even aware of and that he's engaging in and is so we recognize how much we depend on god i'm gonna skip past this part to the next point well eastern orthodoxy tends to lean a bit more in the direction of pelagius this is why the west has the not even pelagianism it's like so if he understood the roman catholic position he would call it pelagian or semi-pelagian so he doesn't he doesn't even know what he thinks that the only position that's not semi-pelagian is if you believe in inherited guilt the sinner but the east doesn't really believe that Here's another way the East and West disagree on God. The West has a more strict monotheism because it believes that what God is, is one thing. Yes, God is three persons, but here we're talking about God's essence. Absolute divine simplicity means God's essence, or what God is, is the same as God's attributes, or the things about God. And simplicity just means that God is not made of parts. So God's power, and God's mind, and God's love are not parts of God, they are the same as God. So when the Bible says God is love, we take that literally, meaning that God is the same as infinite love. The Eastern view is completely different. The East believes that the things about God, like love and power and justice, are just energies that come from God, and God could refer to... Of course, I'm not going to uh, re rehearse that we, we probably re respond to this 500 times. Um, so I've been making videos about the energies for over 10 years. <clears throat> and here is the... Uh, Dr. Bo Branson's lectures right here. If you want to learn what monarchical Trinitarianism is from Dr. Branson, who we just had on discussing this not too long ago, um, here's a great link right there for his lectures. So Dr. Branson gives you one, two, three, four, five, five lectures on what monarchical Trinitarianism is. And it's, the only real consistent way to rebut the Islamic argument of monotheism, especially when we look at the text where Jesus is referring to the father's greater than I, of course it doesn't mean ontologically greater. It means greater in role. So, uh, there is doc avail yourself of Dr. Branson's lectures. I highly recommend it. And again, he should have, he should have looked at some of this stuff before making this video. Cause it really just comes out looking like a, a shoddy corny like level one attempt to explain the differences without even understanding really what the other positions are so there's brant dr branson's talks uh did i put my talk on augustine in there i can't remember if i did here it is if i didn't <clears throat> So because we've refuted and because we've answered the energies uh, stuff, probably five, literally 500 times, I'm not going to repeat all of that. Uh, let's see what he says about theosis. Of God's energies and because God's energies are also called God, in some sense, we become God in the end. Now, the West also believes in theosis. The West also believes that we receive love and immortality from God when we have eternal life. The difference is the West knows that these are gifts that God created for us, but the yeah, so uh, as Paloma says, if we just get another creature, then we are no different than the Aryans. So here he's admitting that his position of created grace is uh, where I, it is created grace. And so therefore the arguments of Athanasius, he claims to really like Athanasius, but Athanasius said that if we're getting in salvation just another creature, then the Aryans are correct. So he doesn't even understand that. He should go read a dialogue between Orthodox and a Barley Mite to, to understand um from god whereas the east thinks that uh, salvation is a part salvation is a gift of god's grace he thinks that's augustinianism actually augustine teaches a cooperative grace so even augustine believes that the will is still present in the human being and the will is still cooperating augustine believes in merits right if you read his books he actually writes about uh merit okay he has works on grace and merit and he doesn't deny merit he wouldn't be a Roman Catholic saint if he completely denied all merit. And he says, well, the merits are still gifts of God's grace. Uh, okay, well, I can agree with that. Oh, my mouse just died. So again, it's word concept fallacies because it depends on what you mean, right? I mean, I can I can believe that my own, uh, uh, my own human energy and will that I have by nature, that I'd cooperate with grace in, is also a gift. Sure. 
So again, it's a lot of equivocating that he does. in God. So ac- according to the West, all you have to do to be saved is accept God's grace, even though different West. Yeah, so he just refuted his own position here. By the way, he didn't even understand that this would be a cr- uh, create. This would be a Christological heresy too, because if Christ, in assuming human nature, didn't do anything but make another created human nature, or that the grace that he gave to his human nature in the incarnation, a la the sixth council, if it's just another creature, then again, he's back at Arianism. So he doesn't even understand traditions it. might disagree on how to receive God's grace. But in the East, there's no way to know if you're united enough to God. Have assurance of salvation. We can know that we are in Christ. Okay, so uh, you can posit that there is theoretically an assurance of salvation, like once saved, always saved or whatever. But the funny thing about all that is that none of that actually, because even in his position as a Calvinist, right, if there's self-deception and Calvinists believe that you're self-deceiving yourself all the time because the noetic effects of sin are affecting you at all times, then there's no way for him as an individual to know that he's not being self-deceived into thinking that he's one of the elect. This alone refutes the notion of assurance of salvation amongst Calvinists. But the East prefers to say things our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. Yeah, this is all, uh, again, word concept fallacy, assuming that uh, post-enlightenment ideas about uh, nominalism and uh, legal standing and divorcing ontology from legality and from uh, propositions, which is a post-enlightenment development, that that's all read back into uh, Isaiah and uh, ancient texts. Now, the ancient world and the medieval world never separated ontology from uh, nom- nominalism, from naming. Okay, so there's no such thing as a purely legal status that doesn't affect your ontology. But if that if that goes away, then all Reformation theology goes away because that's what PSA is built on. Penal substitutionary atonement is built on the post Enlightenment nominalist idea that you can divorce metaphysics from. Uh, naming and le- legal status. So he's just reading uh, in lo- post Enlightenment presuppositions, post uh, Reformation uh, presuppositions back into Isaiah. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. E- Jesus' sacrifice takes away our legal penalty. So again, uh, what does that mean? Okay, it's not a question of can you find a quote. Because this is the same goofy debate that that every reform person, for example, engages when engage them when they say, for example, oh, well, the church fathers talk about the importance of scripture, therefore sola scriptura. Oh, Athanasius is talking about sacrifice, so therefore he means the uh, post-enlightenment ideas of nominalism and uh, pure legal status. No, he doesn't. And if you were to read Athanasius, you would actually know that. By the way, Protestant scholars have already written books on this. Eustitia Day by uh, Alistair McGrath points out that nobody prior to Luther had Luther's idea of justification by faith alone. So even your own Protestant scholars admit this, but he's, what, 21, 22, he doesn't even know. The East rejects original guilt. The Reformed tradition is very intellectual, so we're not a big fan. Yeah, but guess what? Uh, Let's just cut this out right away. Let's use philosophy to make this uh, really simple. If total depravity is true, and if the noetic effects of sin are affecting you at all times, and that includes in your rational theological discourse and your interpretation of Scripture, then you're also, in every case denying the possibility of having the certitude that you claim to have. So every time you're reading the Bible, every time you're reading the text, reading the church fathers, the noetic effects of sin are distorting what you're doing. And in every act, you're actually engaging in some degree of sin on your own view, right? Every act is in some way affected by noetically in total depravity, the effects of sin. So that would actually undercut and cancel out the possibility for him to have the certitude that he has, not just on his supposed doctrine of assurance of salvation, but also on every text that he reads. Every time he tries to go to the Bible, the noetic effects of sin are messing with his interpretation. And so he could never get to the true meaning of the text itself, which is what his whole religion is based on, Sola Scriptura. That alone is enough to cut out all of this word concept fallacy goofy position. So uh, as we expected, I had not seen this video before playing it with you guys. Uh, it was actually worse than I expected. Super low tier, multiple word concept fallacies, lack of familiarity with basic distinctions between the intertrinitarian life and economia when it came to filioque, um, lack of basic understanding of the actual debate of the history of the filioque, um, lack of familiarity with the basic uh, academic sources on the filioque, a la Sashensky and others. Um, 
lack of basic understanding of what the disputes were <clears throat> between Roman Catholics and Protestants, assuming that Augustine is somehow a uh, useful person for Protestants, which is preposterous, uh, assuming that Roman Catholics and Protestants have the same doctrine of original guilt, they don't. So again, multiple fundamental mistakes. Uh, and, you know, Redeem, Redeem Zoomer uh, got really upset over our debate for whatever reason. And so it looks like he's just spiraling and doing damage control. All right, now I wanted to play this video, not because I have, and then we're going to go to open forum, uh, any disputes or dislike of Kennedy Hall. Uh, we've, we've chatted kind of briefly on Twitter uh, in, in uh, uh, cordial ways. So I'm not, I'm not putting this up here to be uh, sassy in any way to him. I don't have any, any disagreement with him. Uh, on a personal level, obviously we disagree because he's, I think, uh, he attends the SSPX. But I thought there were some interesting admissions that we have here from Kennedy here in this clip, in this video. Uh, just a few minutes here, just to kind of catch up with some of the Roman Catholics, see what they're saying. <clears throat> and uh, Kennedy admits that things are getting pretty wild. I just thought the language that he uses, not just, I'm not trying to start smoke. I mean, again, I, I don't have anything. We, we've had cordial interactions. I think he's a nice guy. But the language that he uses here, I thought was pretty wild. It's in good standing. We have people defending that as if it's going to be okay. And then those same people will condemn traditionalists as being against the truth of the faith. We had a men's conference over the weekend. It was amazing. You can check out my talk that's on my channel. It's called Live Not By Lies. I'm working on getting the other talks uploaded. It hey, takes Jamie. a lot of work to get them edited and the audio, video, all those kind of things. I'm an amateur at those things, so I just sort of do Could it when I can. Point being, it was an amazing weekend. And my talk was about... We just have to stop living by lies. You, uh, plug this in. And we it's, can't the just, mask is dead. we just, we can't Into just the, say, uh, well, I don't accept the lies and I won't and say them. Another we have to say, I will always tell the truth. And it's so refreshing. Uh, there was over 200 percent. men there. The only traditional Catholic men's conference in North America. We're going to have to figure out maybe a bigger venue or something. Okay, I'm trying to get to the part where he talks about. Who were hooting and hollering and cheering stuff. on the idea that we should just simply tell the truth. And that's why we're in the mess that we're in is because people have swallowed these lies and have truths for so many decades and they're afraid to speak the truth. We're now at the point where we, where we are so riddled with insanity in the church on behalf of those who run the church that these absolute crazy people are having these ceremonies which are a mockery to God and calling the people who preside over them as heroes and we have the Pope defending egregious sacrilegious blasphemous heretical notions of blessing things that God cannot bless. And if you stand up to that, you're canceled. I'm blacklisted in my diocese. I can't speak in my diocese. I can't get a letter of pastoral approval or whatever because I don't go to a parish run by the diocese because I can't go to a parish run by the diocese. I go to an SSPX chapel and I can't go to a parish run by the diocese because there's not a single parish in my entire diocese where I will not have to submit myself or my children to some of this liberal insanity that has imbibed every single aspect of the Catholic faith. Well, now, wait a minute. If liberalism and apostasy have imbibed every single aspect and avenue of the Roman Catholic faith, then how is Vatican I still true that the See of Rome is the unfailing source of unity, preservation, and truth when it comes to morals and theology? That is the Vatican I dogmatic position. And you just no you notice that Apart from all of the nuances of the specifics of canon law, because anytime you talk to an SSPX person, they're going to go, oh, we got to go look at this canon law, and uh, there's an extremist in, the, in emergency cases, and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Setting aside the, the casuistry of canon law, the very terminology that all the trads and the SSPX use itself betrays that they don't believe Vatican I. They will speak of the Novus Ordo Church as a false church, an anti-church, an apostate church. But that's Rome, you see. And he admits in the video that <clears throat> Vatican II does teach actual heresy. <clears throat> now, I think it teaches heresy in multiple places. But one of those places, which I agree with Kennedy, is the doctrine of religious liberty, which is an absolute 100% clear contradiction from all the previous papal dogmatic statements against religious liberty condemned as a Protestant Masonic doctrine. 
<clears throat> so Kennedy admits that in the position. And again, remember, it's not that we're trying to highlight the differences amongst the trad cats uh, just to be arbitrary. Yeah, you could find differences amongst orth Orthodox. But the difference is that for the trad cats, remember, and for the regular Novus Ordo and all the Roman Catholics, the office of the papacy itself is the solution and the answer to all the things that they criticize Orthodox and Protestants about. And yet when they explain the papacy, the last 70 years, it is apostate, evil, uh, demonic, source of evil, source of division, source of confusion. Wait a minute. So the thing that is the source of unity and certitude and preservation is also the source of division, confusion, and apostasy. Okay, that's a contradiction. So <clears throat> notice the way he speaks. Just a fact. And this is the totalitarianism. This is the totalitarianism. They must reject those who stand for the truth and they must castigate them to the exterior darkness where there is the weeping and gnashing of teeth and they must submit them to humiliation and castigation and ridicule because they have no way of combating the arguments of those individuals because the individuals who are ridiculed unfairly by the, by the church officials are simply telling the truth. They did it with Archbishop Lefebvre and they do it with every person who even stands in a way like he did. Look what they did to Bishop Schneider. Bishop Schneider, and I mean this, and he would say this, he's not even a traditionalist. He just had the audacity to say, you know, some of this stuff coming out of Rome, this is insane. And he's gone. A bunch of other bishops in Latin America, this has happened to them as well. The church is run by crazy people, my friends. So what are you going to do? <clears throat> Wait a minute. The church is run, according to Vatican I, by the infallible C uh, successor to Peter, who has the keys universal jurisdiction and quote never failing faith so how do we have then 70 years of the church's quote run by crazy people if you go read uh, the 15 pages of vatican one if you were to print it out uh, and then kennedy hall goes on to talk about very and i would agree with him obviously the things going on in the roman catholic church are driving the Rome, the trad cats and the roman catholics insane and it is run by crazy people because that's the self-evident, I'm joking, That's it's self-evident, they believe in self-evidence, right? So isn't it self-evident that Francis is insane? Let's just go look at the evidence. Let's just go look, the evidence is self-evident. The evidence means what it says and it says what it means. And Francis is an absolute loon, the rest of the goon cardinals in Rome, the goblins. So Kennedy is absolutely 100% right. However, does Vatican I say that about the papacy. And I'm going to remind the Roman Catholics who 98% of them have not read Vatican I. We're just going to remind them again to <clears throat> go print out the decrees of Vatican I from papalencyclicals.net. comes out to about 10, 15 pages. It's not that hard. It's not that long. Uh, if you're serious about your religion, you should at least be familiar with what Vatican I actually says. And for people that are considering Roman Catholicism, maybe you need to know what the <clears throat> dogmas of Vatican I are. Because it's supposed to be clear, right? I mean, at least the argumentation of Vatican I is that, look, it's obvious. The papacy has a magisterial uh, role. It is the essence of the magisterium. It's infallible, not just in its extraordinary pronouncements, but also in its universal ordinary pronouncements. So therefore it cannot err and it cannot err to the extent that it would lose any of its essential fundamental constituents, right? So, for example, it can never fail to be the case that the See of Peter has successors until the end of the world, Vatican I says. So that counsels out uh, 70 years of vacant see a la Sedevacantus quacks and loons. It says that it can never use that, lose that visible unity. That visible unity is summed up in its head in Rome. So there can never be a loss of unity in the Roman Catholic Church. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There can never be a loss of the magisterial office and jurisdiction, which is only had in communion with the Pope of Rome. 
So if there's been no Pope of Rome, for example, or if the papacy has been thwarted or whatever, then now that would throw into question jurisdiction for the rest of the bishops of the world. Well, if the rest of the bishops in the world have a questionable jurisdiction, then we've now lost the public witness of the unity and continuity of the Roman Catholic Church throughout history, you see. You see how the constituent elements of the papacy are undermined the more a person becomes trad cat. Because the more you become trad cat, the more that you're admitting Roman, I mean, Orthodox positions. And that's why the uh, Alexandria document is so excellent because it uh, essentially admits all of this for us. And we did a whole live stream on it. Roman Catholics haven't even addressed it. They've been super quiet about it. Oh, I, don't, I just don't even care. Well, I'm sure you don't care because it admits all of our... Oh, well, it's not infallible. So, uh, where is the idea that something has to be, quote, infallible for the Pope to be in error or heresy? So, this is just another thing they make up. They make up these uh, new uh, uh, criteria that, oh, well, uh, Francis didn't infallibly define the the Alexandria document, so it doesn't count, even though it admits 90% of the orthodox arguments. Yeah, but in your own position, can I be a Roman Catholic and uh, reject multiple dogmas? No, you can't. You cease being a Roman Catholic when you deny at least even one dogma. That's what Pius XII and Leo XIII state in their encyclicals. You can't deny one dogma and remain a Roman Catholic. You can call yourself a Roman Catholic, but you're not in fact a Roman Catholic. Because by denying dogmas, you now become something else. Protestant, Orthodox, heretic, sectarian, whatever. Old Catholic, Anglican. And, and if, if making something, quote, infallible was a prerequisite to being a heretic then no one could be a heretic but the Pope. That's how stupid this argument is. When they say, yeah, it doesn't count though because Francis didn't make it infallible. Infallibility has nothing to do with whether what he says is heretical or not. For example, when the Sixth Ecumenical Council condemned Pope Honorius, did they all sit around and say, well, but did he say it infallibly? No, they don't even care. Literally nothing to do with no concern at all First of all, because they didn't think that the Bishop of Rome was infallible anyway. Because they condemned Pope Honorius, right? So this is a total red herring when they start talking about, it's not infallible. It doesn't matter. And by the way, Vatican II is infallible. <laughs> so you're in an even worse position <clears throat> if you try to go that route. Uh, if you guys would hit like and share, uh, we're going to open it up now. We covered uh, two of the areas. I did have one last little gem here. <laughs> which was going around, which is the chicken Novus Ordo. The chicken Novus Ordo. And uh, I don't even know what this is, but it is a thing. I mean, just look at the church. It doesn't even look like a, I mean, it's not even recognizable as anything other than a ridiculous Protestant church, right? I mean, the Novus Ordo church is like 90% of them that are built look like Protestant lecture halls. So, I mean, that alone tells you that like, this is not the same religion of the first thousand years of Christianity. And to act like this is the same as Orthodox or something, that's ridiculous. I mean, and this is, this is, this is the, the Novus Ordo is the normative Roman Catholic world. Okay. All of these Roman Catholic pop apologists that are all uniates, they don't even go to the normal Novus Ordo Roman Catholic churches because they know it's a joke. And Kennedy Hall is at least honest enough to say this is preposterous. It's apostasy. Yeah, but the apostasy is coming from the infallible head himself. So therefore, Roman Catholicism is not true. Vatican I is false. Now, you'll notice in uh, Kennedy Hall's uh, video, by the way, and I'll give you the, I've already X'd it out. <clears throat> uh, he says that the Roman Catholic has the advantage of conforming his uh, intellect to reality. And by conforming to reality, you have a basis to reject the woke mob because reality can't be redefined by your system. 
Well, guess what, Kennedy? That same critique applies to your trad Catholicism because your trad Catholicism has to combat the reality of Vatican I, which says that you can't have 70 plus years of apostate papacy. So conform your, real, your intellect to the reality of the facts that this is what the Novus Ordo and normal Roman Catholicism actually is. You understand? This is, this is what Francis has absolutely no problem with. But Francis wants to ban the Latin Mass, which shows that Francis doesn't even care about even loosely maintaining the Roman Catholic tradition. So why do you even have a problem with the chicken mass? What's the problem with the chicken Novus Ordo? When the Chieti the the Chie document admits Orthodox positions and the Alexandria document built on the Chieti document admits 10 times more Orthodox positions. So this just means that Vatican I is not true. And if Vatican I is not true, then the Roman Catholic system falls because it's a system wherein you can't have dogmas canceled out and being wrong. Well, actually in the Roman Catholic system, you can because it evolves. And so the dogmas can be re revised and restated to be whatever you want. But you get what my point though, is that if you've adopted that, then you've adopted a evolving, absolutely contradictory position. And now everything evolves, including the laws of logic. And you can never even say anything's false. So if you want to go this route of ever evolving, never uh, fixed, static propositions and truths, then Rome is where you want to be because it'll evolve tomorrow to be not just blessings for Skittles, but uh, blessings for everything you can think of. That's the next phase. All right, we're going to open it up to the forum. Uh, <clears throat> when I give you the microphone, that means you unmute yourself and you can bring your arguments, bring your challenges What are my comments on the debate with Jake? I already talked about the debate with Jake at the beginning of this. Uh, let's see who's up first. Demetrios. Hello. Yes, sir. All right. Speaking of static and stagnation, one of the common arguments you'll get recently, within the past, let's say, 30 years, from... Uh, Catholic and Calvinist types is the Orthodox Church is in stagnation. We're trapped in the ninth century. Even our artwork is trapped in the ninth century. Like they'll say, like yeah, you're true to the faith, but speaking of, and I'm touching base on the evolving static kind of uh, uh, topic you're addressing just now. Recently, what would your answer to be if I was a, you know, uh, reform? Calvinist type and, or Catholic and came up, eh, you guys are true to the faith, you know, your your Trinitarianism is hardcore more than most, but, you know, you guys are static, you're stuck in the ninth century. What's the, what's the answer to someone like that? Absolutely, and we're proud of it, and I would say that if the faith was once for all delivered to the saints, as the New Testament says, the book of Jude says, then why do we want to evolve and have some other thing? So explication of doctrine is different from the development or evolution of doctrine. So Roman, Roman Catholics believe in <clears throat> the evolution of doctrine to some degree to explain um, new doctrines or uh, things that uh, evolve over time, like they think that icons are something that is some sort of weird uh, evolution that occurs. <clears throat> Can you mute when you're not talking? It's loud background. I have a loud background? Oh, sorry. It's all right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we don't want to evolve, right? And if you read the councils, for example, when the canons begin of the councils, they, they always stress holding the same faith as our forebearers and our forefathers, holding the same ideas and canons that came before. Okay, that's maintaining the same truths, right? That's presupposing and maintaining the same truths without the idea that they evolve, Go ahead. Gotcha. 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 I, I was just interested in your response. And then the second thing is more of like a observation. You know, Calvinists at their best probably represent 5% of Christianity uh, at the most. You know, they're a small portion even of, of Protestants. Uh, do you think, I don't think it's a coincidence when, you know, mainstream,
mainstream media, whether it's in the 90s, Larry King having uh, John MacArthur on for interviews or uh, Christopher Hitchin deciding he's going to do a book tour and a movie with Doug Wilson. Do you think these, you know, atheistic types, uh, unbelievers, specifically pick Calvinists on purpose just to make Christians look crazy? Uh, that could be a motivation there. That's a good uh, a good idea. I never thought about that. Like, why wouldn't they choose, you know, really educated people from uh, other traditions? Um, but also because uh, around that time and even up till now, you'll find that what people that are really active on the internet are people like uh, Calvinists, right? So Reform Zoomer, for example, uh, even though his sect is a tiny fraction of American, you know, religious believers, you know, he's getting massive amounts of views. And so, you know, he needs to be addressed. But in actual fact, uh, you know, Calvinists are like minuscule, right? When it comes to the, the religious beliefs of the West and of America. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't some mm, ulterior motivation to pick some kook or some quack or some, uh, you know, loon to be the representative. It makes perfect sense. I mean, that, for example, atheists love to do this with, uh, remember, uh, uh, Fed Phelps, right? I mean, the, they love that guy, right? He's like a wet dream to the left. Yeah. Yep, yep. And uh, the last observation, we had touched about, touched on this a bit, uh, angelic sin. Now, I want to come back to this as it pertains to Calvinism, uh, because, you know, these, you know, deterministic types are always saying that, you know, we have free will, but we only can choose evil. Uh, we're, 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 we're guilty from birth. And if you think about it, if you think about it, Calvinists, they don't even believe what they preach. I mean, show me the first Calvinist mother and father that deliver their baby in the hospital and they hold it in their hands and they look at the baby and they say, this thing is damnable. I mean, get serious. I mean, like, so getting back to angelic sin, you know, angels didn't, did not, you know, didn't sin in the Garden of Eden, yet they willed evil. They chose and they were immediately, you know, uh, you know, even Christ said, you know, I saw Satan fall like a bolt of lightning mm -hmm. because they were in the, ti in the timeless aeon. In the timeless aeon. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, just that alone, the, the, the fact of the judgment of the angels and their will, uh, free will to sin, and immediately judge because they're in the timeless aeon, uh, I think in some way, in, in, uh, I, we need to write a, an article on this or something, because I think in some way, uh, this shows that this original guilt and, you know, uh, fine, we all believe that we have free will, but we're not autonomous, you know, mm. God's in charge. He's, he's sovereign. Yeah. But this thing like, yeah. It's okay. Like, yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not trying to, it. yeah, I, I agree yeah, with I you. Know. I agree with you. That's a great point. And, uh, <clears throat> for those that are uh, watching the live stream. Yeah. This is the Mayendorf, uh, critique of Augustine. Um, and he makes a really good point about Augustine misunderstanding the passage in Romans five about willing, and that he misunderstood and read everybody in Adam as in an archetype, which was his platonic presupposition there. So actually they have a kind of a platonic presupposition, the Calvinists do, uh, without even knowing it. And uh, this is a great article. It goes into the mistaking, uh, confusing natural will with gnomic will. Um, I mean, imagine if we started asking Calvinists, like, does Christ have a fallen uh, will, right? Uh, I, I don't, I mean, I think they'd be totally lost on that. Uh, it would be really easy to refute them on that point. But you can read that uh, Meindorf article right there, which I referenced earlier about refuting Augustine's mistake on Romans 5. And that right there would actually clear up probably 70% of uh, Redeemed Zoomer's mistake. Sapphire. You got to unmute. <laughs> unmute. Uh, hello. Hey, what's up, man? Yeah, I didn't really come here to debate you because you probably destroy me, but I just had a few questions. Uh, okay, let's make, it, let's make it quick because we're giving disagreeers the floor, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, can non-Orthodox people be saved? I'm very ignorant about Orthodox theology. 
Uh, well, God has the means by which he can unite people to Christ outside of what we know, but no non-Orthodox person can be saved apart from being united to the mystical body. So Christ has, I mean, if you look at the thief on the cross, right, we see that it is possible for God to do that, but. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so as long as someone accepts that Christ is their savior, are they saved? Uh, no, we don't make that judgment. So I can't say that they are or that they aren't. We're not told that. I see. So only God knows in totality who is and isn't saved. Correct. But also just quote, accepting Jesus is kind of ambiguous because even in the New Testament, there's no idea yeah. that. You just like, you know, say a sinner's prayer or something like that. That's a Protestant idea. No, I get that. Because like in Matthew 7, 23, there's the, the people who worked iniquity but claimed to be followers. Like Jesus himself warned about that. Well, I mean, there's also the command to be baptized, to repent, to enter the church, attend the liturgy. Yeah. So you have all kinds of things that we're asked to do. Yeah, I'm not trying to like expose myself. I'm, I'm currently a Methodist, but... I'm, I'm thinking of changing my faith to Catholicism or Orthodoxy. I, I recently went to a Catholic church, and it was a really nice experience. So I'm trying to get more to the roots of what Christ actually teached, you know? Yeah, well, was it the uh, did, was it at a Chick-fil-A? No, no. It was, uh, yeah, no, it wasn't like that German church, dude. I, well, you can go to the chicken mass in Germany and basically just be like going to Chick-fil-A for church. So, but, but look, it's not liberal. It's the traditional chick-fil-a liturgy so it's a traditional chicken liturgy don't listen to, to the liberals <laughs> don't listen to the liberals out there the libtards saying that this is some sort of new modernist chicken liturgy it's absolutely 100 percent the traditional chicken right before i head off i'm gonna let you know uh, i i just met a friend who's from germany and although he's an atheist like he straight up told me that a baptist church like an american baptist church in germany felt more authentic to him than the catholic church yeah that's where we're at yeah i mean yeah that, like i, I even even so when weird. i was a even when i was a roman catholic when i was a trad cat even back then in 2004 the typical episcopal and anglican churches even then were more reverent and more quote traditional in terms of the out uh, exterior than a lot of the novus ordo it's exactly i mean because it's it, there's an agenda being pushed here and it's so obvious yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. here's the thing, though, is that that agenda is not being pushed by liberals. It's not being pushed by random uh, weirdos. It's being pushed by the people that run the church, a.k.a. the Roman See. And if you just read Vatican I, you don't have the right to disagree with the liturgical rites promulgated upon the entire church by Rome. That's in Octorum Fide, which is repeated, not verbatim in Vatican I, but the principles of Vatican I repeat the idea that's expressed in Octorum Fide against the Jansenists that you can call into question the liturgical rites that the Roman See has promulgated for the entire church. So if you disagree with the, no the Novus Ordo, you're in the exact same position as the Jansenists that are condemned in Octorum Fide. That's fascinating. Uh, well, Jay, it was great talking to you. Absolutely. I'll Thank definitely you. be reading that stuff. Thank you so much. Uh -huh, good questions. Let's see here. Next up is An Anurav, Anurav, Anurav. How you doing, Jay? Hey. All right. Um, so when we talk about tag, right, and universals proving or presupposing the existence of God, I'm kind of confused as to how you would show that logic proves the existence of God. Well, <clears throat> the way I like that, that's precisely why I like to make the argument the way I do, which is to argue that tag is really pre-logical. Okay. So and yeah, I, I recognize that you're still using logic, but that's a category error because that's why we say that you can never escape the circularity of the metalogical question of asking, how does logic even work? How do we know logic works? So the logic element of the argument is saying that prior to the actual doing of like first order argumentation that we normally do in logic, we're actually saying that this is a pre-logical question about how is logic even possible at all? So that's all that's all meta logic means is how do we know logic itself works? How do we know logic is logical? And there's nothing wrong with asking that question. It's a whole branch of philosophy. It's called meta logic. Uh, it's, it's, you could say it's part of metaphysics even, right? So the, the idea that I make this up is just ignorance, right? It's not made up. So I'm just taking a discipline, metalogic, uh, or a, a domain of epistemology metaphysics, and I'm saying that this is relevant for how we do tag, because we're saying that prior to the doing of any argumentation at all, there are preconditions for the possibility of logic, 
right? And that would be, in my argument, God himself. God and the specific theology that we have in our tradition is the grounding for the possibility of logic. Now, I'm not arguing that it's true because I said that. I'm arguing that it actually does the work of explaining how the transcendental categories are possible. So that's it. It's, that's it. it may sound fancy and obscure, or whatever. It's not actually pretty simple if you just understand that it's an argument about anything prior to argumentation. So I guess um, the the argument I've come into contact with is just why can't these universals just blanket exist? Like why can't nature just be consistent? Okay, for number one, that's work. arbitrary. So to say something just is, is to be arbitrary. Just is what? And if you can pause it in a debate that something just is, so can I. So God just is. So just saying something is doesn't do the grounding work. It's arbitrary. And also, where are they? What are they? Just to say a universal is, is to say absolutely nothing. And it, it doesn't actually do any grounding work. I mean, universals can't exist in a vacuum. Okay. In my view, they are grounded in the divine mind. And because I have an omniscient being who is all knowing and is uh, ever, you know, all provident, etc., that works to do the grounding. I mean, it's a consistent, coherent position. I'm not saying it's true because I say that. I'm saying that that makes sense. That's coherent. The position where there are no, there is no location or grounding or explanation of what universals are. They're just asserting that it is. Doesn't do any grounding work. So, like when we look at, I think you answered the question already, but I wrote it down anyway. I'm going to ask. So, we don't need God to know that the sun's going to rise tomorrow. That's just a fact about nature, right? How would you respond to an atheist where they say, why do you need God anyway? Well, again, it's arguing that you do ultimately need God to know that because knowing knowing uh, mundane facts is resting on transcendental categories. And so what's the grounding for the transcendental categories? So the preconditions of knowledge, right? So you're, you're, that's a knowledge claim. I know the sun will rise tomorrow. Okay, but how do you know yeah. knowledge is possible at all? So that's a prior claim to any empirical claim or any knowledge claim. So when we're arguing about preconditions of knowledge, it's going to be more fundamental and prior, more prior to anything that's a knowledge claim. So yeah, yes, you do, you, you do need God. Let me, let me, and let's be more, let's be clear what we mean by, do I need quote God to know the sun will rise tomorrow for epistemic justification? You need the theology and the belief of God in God. It doesn't mean that, uh, atheists don't have propositional knowledge about, you know, or beliefs about the sun rising tomorrow. It means justifying the knowledge, not do they have that belief or that knowledge. It means they can't justify the knowledge. So then, okay. Yeah. So I guess, when we and say, let me explain the difference there because, uh, do I, <clears throat> do I know that my car runs on, uh, com uh, computer chips? Yes. Do I, can I explain to you how they work? No. Right. So I don't, ex I can't explain the how, or I don't know what's going on, but I can still drive my car and have a knowledge of the car running without knowing about the computer chips that run the car or the computer. Right. So in, in the same way, <clears throat> can an atheist, uh, believe that the sun will rise tomorrow? Yes. But as David Hume says, as a more consistent atheist, he cannot justify that belief. So you can't justify his own knowledge because correct. The, like if X, then Y, so then Y would be the knowledge and X would be the God, right? That's what you're saying? Well, it's, it's even more basic than that if you're using David Hume's argument. David Hume just simply says that the self, identity over time, induction, none of those things, laws of logic, none of those things can be justified. You just have to, uh -huh. you don't have a basis yeah, I for thought, that. I thought you were going the route of saying because logic is objective, right? Then for there to be any objectivity, well, what I would think is that you need that you need to have God, but that's like I mean, I ultimately, guess, ultimately, you can get to that. It's kind of a, a long way around, but it's just it's even more simple than that. Just simply saying that an atheist can't justify or give an account for how knowledge is possible. That's David Hume's argument. Mm, all right, so I'll look into that. Do you do this often? Like, so I can ask a question next time. Yeah, like five years of it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, good questions, man. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, really good questions. Let's see. Hannibal H Hustle. Hannibal Hustle. Thank you guys for the super chats. We'll read some of those here in a second. We got a nice uh, 900. I guess day streams are pretty good. We get get more people than uh, I'm used to on a day stream. You got to unmute, bro.
Unmute, dude. All right, he dropped off. Next up is uh, now again we're giving pre precedence to people who disagree. Yeah, so if you let's see, he's back. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. I, I was on the phone. That's okay. Yeah. What's on your so mind, dude? I, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about Orthodox theology. That's all. Okay, let's make it quick. So, like, do you guys affirm that if someone does more good deeds, they get like more? stuff in heaven like more rewards greater rewards like in more wicked people get like you know more punishment in hell for example uh i mean it's a little crass like you know you're not we're not like stacking we're not stacking stats in heaven like stacking up my bitcoins in heaven i mean but i mean jesus does say greater rewards greater punishment so yeah paul says it too one star will shine brighter than another star yeah yeah so i have a question like let's say we have like three people Right, three brothers or something like that. And I have one brother who's really pious. Right? And I have another brother who dies as a baby. And another brother who's like wicked and like goes to hell or something like that. Because he's wicked. Right? Okay. And I mean everybody agrees that like babies dying is like an evil. Right? Like it's an evil thing. And, you know, like I guess we're on like the day of judgment or something, like God is talking to the baby and like the baby says hey god you know like this was evil what occurred to me like if i grew up i would have been like good like my big brother who grew up and he went to heaven got all these good stuff and i didn't um yeah i mean we don't typically like out of hand uh you know damn infants that's more of like a protestant uh, augustinian view i'm not trying to be remnant i gotta move on though because this is uh look the, the answer to your question is that only crypto billionaires make it into heaven uh, let's see, Ortho Nerd, what's up, dude? Got a uh, mute. Yo, hey. what's up? Hey. Uh, I had a question. Uh, I'm Orthodox Catechumen, and uh, my aunt, she's like a big John MacArthur uh, Presbyterian. Yeah. Uh, how do I respond to like predestination? Because that's her whole argument for, like, the Bible canon and why it was changed and everything. How do I refute any of that? You don't. You just, uh, do you know how to, do you know how to do, uh, like, really hard thumping like this? Like, 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 clicking. <laughs> so, you just wait till, uh, wait till your mom's over there doing the dishes. Walk up behind her and go, pow, whap her. Just, just, just do a big a thump. <laughs> Try to knock some sense into her? <laughs> no, just... Just do it. Uh, not even for any reason. Just do it. I'm just joking, man. Um, what's the question? Predest I have a, a bunch of videos on predestination, so or on yes. uh, Calvinism and all that. So, uh, yeah, my buddy, uh, uh, what's his book called? Pre um, just type in uh, Orthodox, comma Calvinist, comma predestination. And uh, one of my buddies wrote a book, and I can't remember the title of the book now, um, but it should come up. I think his name is uh, Jeremy. Uh, Kaitif, Kaitif, Kaitif. That's a joke, by the way. Don't thump your mom. Don't don't get into flick battles with your mom. Tell your mom to hold out her, her fist. Bah, whap, whap, and tell her if she can't stand 20 of your thumps, then predestination is false. That's how you prove it. What's up, dude? I'm you. So remember, request to speak, you unmute. Kai Tiff, do you want to speak? You got to unmute. Are you there? Hello? You got to turn your mic on, man. I don't know. Can't hear you. No sound. Try to turn your mic on, come back. Come back out and come back in. Next up is from a point of view. What's up from a point of view? Thank you guys for those super chats. We're having fun today. 900 in the middle of the day. Interesting. So I guess more people are on the internet uh, at, at freaking 2 o'clock than they are at 10 o'clock. So, hey. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. How you doing? Uh, hey, what's up, Jay? It's uh, nice talking to you again. Um, I, I, I didn't want to take up too much of your time because I know that you want to 
get two more people who actually disagree with you. But um, uh, could you have a few minutes to answer my question? Okay. Um, well, I don't want to be like starting this off on a down or note, but see, my uh, grandmother, she passed away this week on uh, uh, a few days ago, and we just had her funeral on Wednesday, and I'm sorry I for your loss. To, thank you, and um, I just want to know, I don't know if this is uh, important, but uh, uh, what would be the Orthodox uh, Christian perspective on um, on euthanasia, for example? And, and, and to give context, because my grandmother, she suffered from severe case of um, dementia for many years, so she was slowly starting to forget who she was, who a lot of the people around her were, and uh, yeah. and slowly was developing many other diseases, like not right. being able to move, not being able to eat or speak. And in her final few weeks uh, being alive, she was, I mean, you can pretty much categorize her as a vegetable, so... Yeah, I think I think the, the typical answer is uh, that's a great question, and uh, sorry for your loss. I think typically we we're pretty much against uh, euthanasia at all in all forms, except uh, you know there might be a situation where it's not necessarily euthanasia, uh, where somebody makes a decision to you know no longer continue I don't know life support or something. That's a decision that people who are bioethicists and there are orthodox bioethicists. Um, Tristam, uh, Englehart, for example, was a famous Orthodox, uh, bioethicist, uh, for many years. He, he passed away. I forget what year, not too long ago, but, um, so there's, there's other people who have that role. And so that would be somebody that you would ask that kind of question to, cause it's not, I don't have any training in, in bioethics, but I would say that generally speaking, Orthodoxy definitely is uh, opposed to euthanasia. Uh, Partik, what's up? We're going to Partik like it's 1999. You got to unmute, bro. Yeah, hi. Hey, what's uh, up, can man? Can you hear me? Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, uh, so first of all, I'm a big fan of Rachel and Andrew. Hey, Rachel. So um, uh, my question is that, um, as you guys must know, that uh, the church in Russia is still pretty uh, pretty good. And when, when we compare that to America, so but it's still separate from the state. So what do you think Russia did right in terms of preserving or saving the church from feminism and things like that? Um, good question. I guess that it's probably just, you know, the Slavic peoples maybe have a more uh, innate antipathy towards that. I think a lot of Western social engineering and toxic culture hasn't fully penetrated uh, Russia yet. So there's probably a lot of different reasons why Russia isn't as bad, but you know, what's being unleashed is being unleashed globally. So, you know, uh, even places like China are trying to figure out how to, you know, stave off uh, the unleashing of all of this toxicity. Jana, uh, what's up, Jana? You got to unmute. Are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, I thought you was a chick. What's up, Jana? Jana the Mana? Um, so I was uh, recently debating one of my friends. What's that? I was recently debating one of my Protestant friends. Oh, uh-huh. He, he fully um, refuted, well, he didn't refute, I found his arguments rather weak, but he didn't even accept that the apostles had any power. They, he rejected the apostolic succession. He, he rejected even the apostles themselves. And uh, I don't know how to argue against that point. Well, yeah, I mean, I would just look up, uh, you know, orthodox arguments for apostolic succession. I mean, you have the apostles being told by Jesus, he who hears you hears me. And if you read the book of Timothy, Paul lays his hands on Timothy and says, you are the successor to me in Ephesus. I mean, he doesn't say those words, but he's saying that I appointed you in Ephesus, right? You then lay hands on men after you. So really first and second Timothy with 
the statements that Jesus says to the apostles is, is really kind of like the most clear, in my view, argument for apostolic succession. But then we can get into the church fathers of the first and second century already arguing for being successors to the apostles, the bishops as successors to the apostles, Ignatius, Irenaeus, they all really argue and speak this way. So um, that would be where I would say you could start your argumentation if you're rep responding to a Protestant. <clears throat> uh, let's see, punished. What's up, punished? You got to unmute. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, man? Uh, uh, hey, Jay. Hey. Uh, also, hey, Rachel. Nice actually speaking speaking with you for the first time. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, um, obviously, I'm, I'm a catechumen, Orthodox catechumen, but I have had a bit of an issue regarding... Uh, people in the Orthodox faith. I'm not sure if it's a common thing, uh, but it's something that's giving me a bit of like, uh, like a crisis in, in terms of like a denomination where it feels a lot like uh, a lot of the Orthodox that I communicate with are very, um, they're very isolated in their, in their churches and they're very isolated in their, in their, in their faith. They don't like, uh, like people from outside of their faith coming in. Uh, you, I know you experienced that when, when you went to an, uh, a Greek Orthodox church in, in the U.S. Uh, and I experienced the same thing when I went to a Russian Orthodox church here in my country. Uh, and I wanted to ask, like, why, why do you think there is this sort of like uh, almost like no, no attempt to like reach the outside from, from a lot of Orthodox churches compared to like a lot of Protestants compared to Mormons and uh and, uh, and Baptists and stuff like that. What do you think that is? Uh, I mean, you know, Orthodox nations out there other than America do tend to be, um, uh, by their very nature of being kind of national churches, still somewhat ethnic. But, I mean, this exists in Protestantism and Roman Catholicism as well. So it's not, I mean, I'm not saying that it's everywhere in Rome, but it's not everywhere in Orthodoxy either. So, you know, I don't know what country you're in. I, I can't speak to that, but... You know, check out, do you have other options? you have like other uh, Orthodox options you could check out? And if you're, you know, if you find the uh, people to be cold at first, can just continue to go there and try to warm up to the priest. Because if you warm up to the priest, then eventually the people will uh, warm up to you as well, I think. Uh, because, you know, maybe they think that you're just kind of an outsider or something like that. But today we're and uh, I'm not trying to uh, dismiss your question. It's just, I don't, I don't really know what the, I mean, that's definitely one problem that can arise in Orthodox churches. It's not solely an Orthodox problem. It does exist in other churches as well, but I haven't been to Orthodox churches in other countries, so I don't really know what that's like. I take that back. I've been to Orthodox churches in Italy and uh, you know, one of the Orthodox uh churches we visited in Italy, they were having to meet at a Roman Catholic church because they were doing the uh, liturgy where the relics were. And there was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of Russian babushkas there that were acting kind of wild. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, I can understand where you're coming from, but I would say just try to befriend and get closer to the priest if you can. Uh, let's see. We're taking uh, topics and questions for people who disagree or wanted to debate. Typically today, not not dissing you, punished. I'm just saying. Um, if you go, if you disagree, go to the head of the line. Cart Cartif, you want to try again? You tried earlier. Let's see if we can get you back on. Car go ahead, Cartif. Gotta unmute. Hey. You got me? Yeah. All right. Uh, I had a quick question for you. It was, uh, how can I reason about language that is open to such interpretation that it can mean whatever you want it to mean? If language can mean anything, then it means nothing. As a Christian apologist, I have to ask, why should I listen to you if what you're saying is indistinguishable from gibberish? And how are you any better than astrology or other woo-woo? Well, first of all, Okay, first of all, I've, I've never argued that 
words and language can mean anything you want it to mean. So no idea where you got that. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't, when I say you, I just mean like the general Christian, like the general religious person as an atheist, Christian apologist. I don't mean you specifically. Sorry. <clears throat> well, but if that's not my position, why, why, do you want me to address everyone else's position? I don't understand. Well, I'm just curious. Like, obviously, I'm not a atheist and even... Even as a non-religious person, I can understand that, uh, you know, uh, they, you know, religious people have a definition for their language. I don't exactly understand it. So, uh, well, hold on. So, okay. So is the objection that, uh, all theological and metaphysical terms are gibberish? Well, it, uh, sub a abstract scientific definition, I, I, you know, I'm, Okay. Not sure what else to call okay, it. Okay, so this so. is like, uh, are you familiar with any critiques of like basic level scientism and like empiricism? Because that's what this amounts to. I would be happy if you had any authors to recommend to me or something. I well, I mean, we could just make the argument right here. Like, uh, sure. how do you know or what does it even mean to think that there's a quote, basic scientific definition of what exists? Uh, well, I guess... Uh... I, I'd start with like uh, Descartes solipsism. I can't prove anything outside of my existence, so I need to have multiple people verify my results, and then you have you know develop some sort of consensus over time. And okay, and becomes... let's let's get more basic than that though. Like, um, okay. how do we know? How, so, all knowledge comes through sense data. I mean, that's essentially scientism. Is that is that your view? Sure. Okay. So the problem with that, though, is that that proposition itself is not in sense data. So it's a self-refuting first uh, proposition, first starting point. So it's a self-destructive argument? Correct. Okay. I'll have to consider that. That's a very interesting point. Well, if that's where the epistemology starts and it can't get off the ground, then every sentence from that point on uh, says nothing. So it's actually your position that makes no coherent statement. Okay, so I'm sorry. Could you just repeat that? Uh, so if if it's if it sentence, is the case that data. your if you, if it is the case that your epistemic starting point is self-refuting, then any other assertion or proposition you make would also be nonsense and self-refuting. So basically, sentences sure. are impossible. Okay, but so so I, I in order to have in order to use language, I have to not use uh, not consider sense data. If I'm, I'm no. not, maybe I'm not literally, understanding. Literally, literally not at all what I said. I said absolutely okay, nothing I'm, I'm like that. To, I'm sorry. I'm trying to understand. Said so your starting point, your first, the the place you want to jump off, your, your, the, the, the place you want to hinge your epistemology on. Okay. It's not a language sure. problem. It's epistemology problem. Is itself a self-refuting starting point. And so therefore any other propositions or sentences you try to make also fail because the epistemic starting point fails, you see. So ep epistemology is more fundamental in what we're talking about than your theory of languages, the theory of language and signs. <laughs> okay, so the premise, the, my premise is false because uh, our, our lived experience uh, transcends our ability to describe it with language or something along those lines. Well, uh, I could just simply say that the universal claim that all knowledge comes through sense data is a contradiction because knowledge, that proposition isn't found in sense data. And so you're subject to all the problems of David Hume, who's a more consistent atheist empiricist than any other atheist empiricist, which means that the result is skepticism. So Hume's arguments say basically that there's no way to give an account for uh, the uh, the self identity over time laws of logic induction uh, uh, predication meaning all those things fail and if all those things fail then sentences and knowledge are impossible and and Hume was fine with that saying that our knowledge is not justifiable so if knowledge is not justifiable if you want to be a consistent atheist then you can't argue against Christianity and you don't know science science is impossible <laughs> I think that's a fantastic. Uh, argument and I really appreciate you uh, you sharing that with me. I sure. will I will read into Hume. Yeah, go read David Hume because yeah he's he's yeah. the consistent atheist and he's my, he's my favorite atheist because he's the one that's consistent where the rest of the atheists aren't. Uh, let's see, Mars Monkey, what's up? So remember to get today. It's uh, people who disagree. Hey, what's up? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if you caught the 
James White debate with uh, Trent Horn. It was pretty interesting. I did see it. Yeah, I thought it was good. Uh, I my brief thoughts are that um, on the topic, uh, I think Trent won. Uh, on the topic. However, I do think James White brought up uh, great points about the papacy contradicting on moral issues and issues like the death penalty, but that wasn't the topic of the debate. However, uh, those were good zingers by White against Trent. <laughs> yeah, I, I, he said something interesting. This is the question I have to you is how would you like comment on this or, or respond to this? He, uh, he said that the, the silent period between Malachi and the New Testament he, he said that that's sort of the way you got to view the paradigm of Protestantism is that there's this silent years between the early church and then, you know, the Reformation. How would you comment on something like that? Yeah, then he's already admitted that the scriptures alone are not the sole rule of faith in those silent years. And that undercuts sola scripture. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I mean, right there, he lost the debate, and that he—that's an admission. I don't have to go into disproving all of the Protestant positions if James White admits that, even even for a time period, there's another uh, something else beyond sola scriptura that is a, a rule of faith. Cool, man. That's all I got. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Nope. What's up, Nope? Nope. Yeah, I understand, Everett. Like, there's there's other art ways we could respond to um, to White. We could point out that the way he understands the intertestamental period actually isn't the way he thinks it is. And the idea that the Old Testament soul scripture also isn't true. Um, they had judges. They had, you know... Uh, interpreters of the law who made decision with authority uh the synagogue system and the elders and all of that if you look at the way that was set up it's not the way james white thinks so yeah we can address all of that but just in terms of the proposition in the debate when it, when white made those admissions I, in my view he lost the debate uh that specific debate that doesn't mean that we have to that that addresses every claim of trent or James White, it means that the specific proposition they were debating, I think that's the point in which James White lost that debate. And I would add, if you want a fuller treatment of how the Old Testament actually functioned in terms of text and authority with the priests and the Levites, then um, the debate that we did with, who's that Protestant guy? Uh, Dale? Yeah. So Dr. Branson did a good 30-minute uh, exposition on how to understand the relationship of text and Levite and priest. Here it is, this one, in this debate. Protestant so watch uh, this uh, two-hour, 40-minute debate if you want a fuller treatment of more specifically how James White wasn't even really technically correct about I me. Mean, James White's acting like, oh, well, in the Old Testament, they were sola scripturis. No, it actually says to the law and to the testimony in Isaiah, right? And uh, Israelites weren't running around quoting uh, sola scriptura scroll texts to one another to try to prove, you know, sola scriptura, Old Testament, Protestantism. I and mean, that's silly, but... Uh, if you want a fuller treatment, then watch the, the Bo Branson talk right there. All right, what's up? Uh, nope. Hey, um, I had heard about these saints that have um, dealt with demonic possession, and I was interested because you know Orthodox Christians, when you're baptized, you're said. Okay, to so the to is this related to the? I'm not trying to be rude. Is the topic? Uh, the topic is debating God's existence and so forth. Is that is that part of that? God's existence, no, not necessarily. Okay, well, so that's the, I'm not trying to be rude, but that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the topic today. So I'm not trying to be rude to you, but the topic is we're debating God's existence, Islam, Catholicism, atheism, Protestantism. Uh, and if you disagree, go ahead and line. Let's see. He's been waiting a while. gerdell has been waiting a while. What's up, Gerdell? Orthodox. 
got to unmute. Gerdell. Is this Kurt Gerdell himself? Are we channeling? So it looks like he's got a bad connection. Gerdell, you want to pop out, pop back in. I'll bring you to the front of the line because it's not connecting you. Let's try, let's see who's next. Patrick, Masonic Nonsense, what's up? You gotta unmute, man. Uh, it's me. Mm-hmm, it is you, what's up? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So I have two questions, a uh, couple of uh, quick questions about Protestantism and then uh, God's existence. So my first question is just your opinion on this, like uh, uh, Protestants who do deliverance uh, on uh, people, because I've seen a I've seen a lot of like people on the internet who have their like these deliverance ministries and stuff, and it seems really like convincing. But then again, I was taught that there is no grace outside the Orthodox Church, at least regarding to these things. Well, I don't. I mean, you've got TV preachers who you know have been busted being con men. Um, you know that's possible. You've got people who could genuinely be delivered by God's mercy. Uh, you know, the, the guy casting out demons in Mark is outside the church and Jesus says, let him alone because anyone who is apart from us will not forever be apart from us. He'll soon be uh, amongst us. So yeah, I mean, anything's possible, but those things don't prove or disprove any of the religions because any of those manifestations that are claimed to be miracles uh, could always potentially be deceptions. So miracles will attest to what's the true faith, but they can't be proofs of the true faith. Miracles themselves, miracles okay. alone. So what's the next question? Let's move All on. Right. Uh, next question is, uh, if nothing is created or if nothing uh, created is inherently evil and all creation comes from God, then why do, for example, nuclear bombs exist? Well, even an explosion uh, is just fire. It's just heat. Like fire and heat aren't bad or wrong. So why would fire and heat are in themselves be wrong but it's just like anything else when it's misused it's the misuse that's the the error or the wrong it's not the thing itself so just like a gun right the atoms and the molecules in the gun and the bullet are not inherently evil but to misuse them against another human being is the misuse yeah but let's say that you have like straight up like technology that was meant to like harm uh the mankind like for example yeah but the intentionality doesn't make the the material itself evil so that would be gnostic or yeah, manichaean yeah. okay all right we're gonna move on those are, uh, thanks for those questions let's see uh uh let's see who was next in line logos uh, hello hey Dave, first, first thing I want to say is thank you for all the stuff that you do. Um, you okay. led me to the Orthodox Church. Thank you. Um, it's good to hear. And, uh, yeah, and uh, I wanted to ask you, recently there was a hilarious uh, debate, well, Twitter debate with Bryson Gray uh, talking about he's not a sinner and that because he's been baptized. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because he's, because he's been baptized. He's a new creation, therefore he's not a sinner. But I find that argument to be so out there i wouldn't even know how to respond to it if someone said that to me in real life like <laughs> well i mean john says that we say we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us so right yeah, some, some things like that like extremely bad for me i did have another question no 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 there, first john said right so first john right if we say we have no yeah. sin we lie and the truth is not in us so i'm saying that refutes bryson Great. And I and, think if you, uh, if you watched our debate, I mean, Bryson is, has like out to lunch, no clue what he's talking about. Yeah. And another thing I, I wanted to ask is like when people like this come about, is it best to just leave it alone sometimes? Um, yeah, because, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I yeah. I think you have to have a case by case basis, right? You, you learn, I think over time, uh, who's yeah. worth interacting with and who's not. Now I'm not saying that, 
it was not worth interacting with Bryson because we'd never had an interaction other than like a five minute exchange at a live debate. Right. So he came to that live debate in Nashville and, and was in the audience and we had about a five minute exchange back and forth. And so at that point I thought, well, it's worth having a protracted, you know, long discussion with Bryson. And so that's why we did that debate. Um, but like, at, would I do another debate with Bryson? I don't really think there'd be much point in it. I think it's just going to be the same types of stuff over and over. So I think over time you realize, like a lot of people say, why don't you debate so-and-so? Why don't you debate so-and-so? Well, most of these people, I've already kind of seen them in multiple debates. I know what they're going to be arguing. Typically when people are doing that, it's almost always really low, low tier people, right? Like uh, people who've never had a philosophy class, never written a paper, don't know anything about fallacies. And it's just like their minions saying, when are you going to debate so-and-so? It's like, well, I mean, he's already done like 10 debates and performed terribly. Why do I have to debate this person who is just going to be the exact same thing over and over? And a lot of the low tier AT, it's like, I'm not going to debate T-Jump again because it's, it's like we already saw, you know, so there's no point. So I think you just learn over time who's worth engaging with and who's not. Makes sense. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for answering the questions. And uh, yeah, um, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Love yeah. this. Thank you, Logos. Appreciate that. Good questions. So, guys, it's open forum. Uh, we got uh, almost uh, upwards of not, almost 100. We got 84 listening live over on Twitter. Uh, the way it works is if you're listening on Twitter, you ask to speak, request to speak. I give the microphone and then you come on. You can make whatever arguments you want. Uh, make sure they're arguments, please. Arguments is not arguing. Argument is a proposition with supporting evidences and claims. So, uh, let's see. Sapphire Scribe. What's up? Hey, yeah. Hey, how's it going, Jay? Yes, sir. Uh, I had a uh, one serious question and one uh, kind of quick question after that, if I can. Okay. Um, I was uh, in a uh, Discord uh, group chat, and there were a few Muslims in there, and uh, I mentioned how um, all things uh, proceed from the Father, and they said, oh, we believe that too. So can you kind of outline for me, uh, I'm not like super familiar with like the, the Islamic, like, uh, outlook on that I, I know it's not the same as the Orthodox well this is just idea. illustrating what we said earlier about the word proceed being vague I mean that can mean a lot of different things I mean they mean that I think they just mean that yeah creation comes from Allah okay we believe that creation comes from God too but we also believe that the Son and the Spirit come from God so yeah. coming coming from God does not equate to being a creature and they're arguing that anything coming from God is a creature Gotcha. Yeah, see, that's something that uh, I knew it was distinct because uh, it was in, I, and and, I, and my red flag was already up because uh, they were being inordinately nice, uh, and uh, I was mentioning about you know I was talking in a roundabout way about like the Trinity, so it was it was kind of weird how they were coming at me uh, a little bit, you know, like oh this is what we believe, this is similar to what we believe, so I just well, no, that's just word concept fallacy. It's like Mormons do the same thing. Be like, oh, we believe Jesus is God. And it's like, yeah, you believe in multiple gods. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a lot. Of, a lot of cults and groups just basically hinge everything on ambiguity in words and terminology. So that's a huge part of. I mean, again, Basil says this. He says heretics always make like grammar and and word concept mistakes. So, thank you for that question. There, we're going to move on to uh, open forum with Jack. Uh, then he dropped off. Jack, if you want to come back on, just request to speak. Uh, Philip, what's up, Philip? Got to unmute, Philip. Hey, what's up, Jay? Hey. Hey, uh, I had a question about tag. Um, okay. I don't know if that's technically on topic for right now. I mean, now. we've had like, yeah, we've had like five tag questions. Go ahead. Okay, cool. So I was watching your debate with uh, Dillon T uh -huh. recently, um, just to sort of like, just because I'm very new to the philosophical side of Christianity. And so I was trying to sort of buff up on that, okay. at least a little bit. Um, but it seems, and uh, excuse me, <clears throat> sorry, it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, it's not so much that... Uh, because logic exists, therefore we can apply a God, but it's like logic, um, identity over time, 
uh, knowledge, like all of these things correspond to one another in such a way that it's like, sure, atheists can point to them and say, oh, look, there's knowledge or there's logic or there's identity over time. But it, the fact that they correspond to each other as well would imply that there is something that connects them. Is that sort of on the right yeah, track? I mean, <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't say the word correspond. I mean, they, they interrelate. I mean, they, they absolutely go together. You know, un- universals relates to uh, laws of logic. Uh, laws of logic relates to... Can you mute, bro? It's loud in the background. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, universals relates to numbers and mathematics. I'm not saying they're identical. I'm saying they relate to one another in an intricate way, right? And so the external world, right, is a necessary precondition for knowledge. Um, the self, the I, having the knowledge, right? The knowledge presupposes a knower, right? So all of these things kind of go into and are presupposed by uh, the act of knowing or whatever, and they all require a certain kind of world, basically. For example, we couldn't have a world where everything was one, right? Let's say we were monists or pantheists, right? Oh, everything's one and we're all God, dude. Well, that would really destroy the possibility of knowledge because now we're not actually knowing facts. We're just simply knowing ourselves or we are God or everything is all is one. So distinctions are illusory, right? There's a lot of different traps that something like a monist position might fall into. And they're falling into those traps because they're not recognizing that for knowledge to be possible, we need a certain kind of world. A certain kind of world means certain types of metaphysical truths and principles and structure. So that's what the transcendental argument is arguing that there's a certain type of world that's necessary for, to make knowledge possible, certain type of metaphysics, certain type of epistemology. And when we have that type of world, we can then posit the possibility of knowledge. So the argument is not about first order reasoning. The argument is about higher metalogical possibility of reasoning at all so almost every atheist when they hear this argument misunderstands this and they think that the argument is just me asserting that god exists therefore god exists no it's saying that the transcendental categories necessitate and relate to one another in an interlocking interrelated way and that any act of knowledge presupposes those transcendental categories and so therefore how do we make sense of the categories since they're prior to any knowledge claim or they're prior to the doing of logic. It's a meta-logical, meta-knowledge question. Gotcha. And so, so yeah, it seems like the atheist would just be able to point to, like, logic and knowledge and identity over time as just, like, disparate things. And Well, but they're not disparate things. It doesn't make any sense to talk well, about knowledge over time without a knower. How could they... Yeah, but that's, that's what I'm saying is from their position... It, like they don't have an account for how they correlate or how they well they don't have that well they don't they just they don't it's not that they don't have an account for how they interrelate they also don't have an account for the things themselves individually i mean that's that's david hume's point is that an, uh, an atheist an empiricist cannot give an account for any of the individual things identity over time the self uh the external world uh you know induction laws of logic Okay, cool. Yeah, that was it. Thanks, man. Yeah, good questions. Uh, let's see. I don't know if... Uh, Father Deacon, if you want to comment on that, um, you can while I go TT to the little girl's room. Are you there? Sorry, did you ask a question? I said if you want to comment on the tag uh, uh, points there, the, the, the idea of you know, maybe what you're going to argue in your paper, or if you want to comment on any of that, since you requested to speak, you can, I do have to go to the, the little girl's room. Yeah. So, I mean, often one confusion is because it's called a, a transcendental argument that, um, it's solely restricted to accounting for transcendentals, but that's not the case. I mean, if we go back to just Immanuel Kant, um, transcendental deduction is neither a deductive nor an inductive argument but it is an argument kind of prior to arguments that what is the necessary condition what would make this possible now of course we can ask that about the transcendental categories because there's many things that are prior to other things um there's things that we presupposing the level goes up well one of those things of course is logic identity over time 
um, knowledge and different things that could possibly be put into transcendental categories, all of which must be assumed in order to to make legitimate inferences, deductions, um, and various epistemic um, or even sensory um, actions, uh, semantics, etc. Um, but really, the trans the transcendental argument is is even prior to that. Yeah. So what is and I specific, you know, there's many different things that you can uh, focus on within a transcendental argument. Um, they all, sh- you know, in other words, there's many different types of transcendental arguments for the existence of God that right. you can give. All of them have in common what is the ultimate necessary conditions that make and plug in any of this possible. Um, I tend to focus on the epistemic questions. Um, so I may not focus on transcendentals. I may just focus on, well, we use logic. We think it's legitimate. Um, and I say that to distinguish from valid because somebody might get confused with their valid forms. But by legitimate, we believe that if we follow certain kind of rules, logical rules, um, we get what we want in terms of getting knowledge. And most people never kind of ask more kind of meta epistemological questions. Well, why is that? What actually makes that possible? Um, And what would make that impossible? Now, keep in mind, um, there's no one who's presuppositionless. When we read text, um, when we do various actions, we come with various presuppositions. Um, some of those presuppositions make the things that we want impossible. Um, namely, knowledge that there, it's not just that um, somebody's paradigm might have inconsistencies, because anybody's paradigm could have, you know, well, I was wrong about this, I was, it, this inconsistent. There's more kind of fundamental issues that certain presuppositions that one could have would literally make knowledge impossible. And so it ends up being self-defeating versus just maybe uh, a smaller kind of epistemic problem. Yeah, great point. So that's something that we point out and that, again, when you start thinking through this, it boils down to only two positions, uh, presuppositions. And those presuppositions, we all want to give an account for the world. What does that account mean? There's a presupposition of story that that explains stuff. And everybody has one, and and some fit better than others. Um, And some make storytelling and accounts and knowledge completely impossible. And ultimately, it's going to boil down to either... um, you have a story about uh, a creator who creates all of these things and grounds them. knowledge, experience, identity over time, physical laws, laws of identity, um, logical laws. And so there's a purpose behind, there's an intention behind. Or the only other presupposition is there isn't, it's an accident, in which case that makes there is no meaningful story that could be told because why it's what's the opposite of meaning Uh, accident the opposite of knowledge accident ultimately that's the story that that the other person tells so again the question is the most fundamental sort of question with a transcendental argument for the existence of god is what possibly could be prior epistemically than God. And what we'll find is in any attempt to explain that is self-defeating. It can't accomplish what it does. So by impossibility of the contrary, God must be, there's no arguments that it strictly that are behind God that you prove God by. He is the first epistemic principle by which anything could be known or proven. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, great points. All right, let's see. Next up is 
waiting waiting Lucans. <clears throat> Got it on mute, bro. Hello, hello. Hey. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, what's up, Jay? Yo. Uh, yo. So I'm, uh, I'm currently Presbyterian, but I've been like, uh, kind of exploring Orthodoxy more. Uh, very intrigued by, very intrigued by it. Um, I have a few questions related to eschatology, if that's cool. Uh, well, today's discussion is about disagreements, uh, and particularly. Islam, Roman Catholicism, so it's not it's not the topics today. What what's your? I'll answer the basics. What's the basic question? So the basic question is like is um kind of is it within a valid Orthodox interpretation? Like if for the all that discourse, like that's entirely about Jerusalem and the temple, or is that like does it apply to both then or also to the very end of the of like yeah? I think creation? it's a it's a both end. Okay, that's uh. Yeah, it's typically right, cool. typically the way like uh you know Saint John Chrysostom, uh, when he interprets it, he says it's seventy A.D. and it's the end of the world. All right, let's see. Uh, good question though, Vlad. What's up, Vlad? Y'all going to the chicken mass later? The chicken Nova Sorta? Do you hear me? What's up? Yeah. Hello, Jay. Uh... As an Orthodox Christian myself, I want to ask about uh, Orthodox issue. What does a proper view of the rights? Do they exist? Of what? Rights. Like, uh, I have a right to do something, or we have rights to, I don't know, to do yeah, something. I mean, it just depends on what you mean by rights. I mean, if you mean, like, the natural law or some moral law or something like that, then then that's what it means. If you're like an enlightenment atheist libertarian, then no rights, rights don't exist. They don't make any sense. There's no reason to believe in them. So it really just means on what we mean by those words, but good question. Daniel, what's up, Daniel today, guys, remember it's people that disagree debate. So I understand a lot of people have questions and that's okay, but we want to give preference to the people who disagree today. Got to unmute. Danny, do you want to talk? You got to unmute, man. Uh, Jay, I have, hey. a, I have a few que- I have one question, actually. Uh, sorry that I'm uh, delaying the people that uh, are the opposite. It's okay. What's, what's the question? We'll do it quick. Um, so, you know, the I was watching a video by uh, Brother Nathanael, and uh, he was uh, refuting Ben Shapiro. I was just wondering... Uh, Ben Shapiro said uh, that uh, anyone can be the, uh, well, Jewish Messiah, even though there's already been a Messiah. Um, How will that Messiah prove that he's their Jewish Messiah, like the false Messiah, without the genealogies of David? Um. You know, in in, Jude, in rabbinic Judaism, there's probably as many different theories on the Messiah as there are rabbinic Jews. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, shout out to your boy there. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know what the Messiah would even mean if it's no longer Davidic descent. But <clears throat> I'm sure there's a million different rabbinic ideas. I mean. <clears throat> they, they, there's Jews that think that Rabbi Schneerson was the Messiah. So, you know, to me, that's all just all over the place. So, um, but how would the, in, like, <clears throat> how would a fake Messiah? Well, I mean, Schneerson wasn't the Messiah and I think people believe he was and that he'll come back or something. So, I mean, I, I guess it depends on which group he convinces, like what they think the criteria would be. So if you, you know, believe that Messiah will be a, davidic warlord it seems like you would have to have the davidic uh you know genealogy so yeah seems like it's all over the place jamie i don't think this coffee is right (laughs) um tamara hey jamie You 
guys would hit like and share. Go ahead and unmute. All right. Well, if you're not going to talk, then we'll move on. Uh, Pissar. Cataclysm sends $10 and says, I loved uh, your debate. Uh, Orthodoxy wins. Could you address uh, joke the Macaque magician, quote, mining father Stan Eloy? Yeah, I think he was trying to get the idea that there's three minds because there's uh, three centers of consciousness or persons or agents. But, um, of course, we don't reduce mind to trait of nature it's one mind in the triad that exists in the mode of the three hypostases that have it so jake was confusing natural property with hypostatic property and confusing person with mode or tropos so pasar what's up uh how's it going um how do you reconcile uh catholic saints with like orthodoxy are they if um Catholic Church has fallen from grace or what have you. We, we don't. We don't accept Roman Catholic saints. So what do you mean? So how do you explain them in their lives and their supposed long line of miracles? Well, I mean, do you think miracles prove or disprove a position? That's the problem. Um, I mean, I could bring on a bunch of Muslims that tell you that uh, Quranic miracles prove the Quran. So miracle claims don't do anything except uh, attest to the true position. They don't prove the true position. Okay. So we just take them as sort of regular Catholic believers as Orthodox. I don't know what that means. What do you mean? So we, we don't, um, like, there's no reason to really look further into them. As, like as orthodox well Christians i mean or... you, i guess you do what you want but i'm saying that that's not going to determine which religion is true is miracle claims because every religion in the world claims miracles evangelicals will claim miracles and say that that disproves Roman catholicism i mean miracles will attest to the true faith they literally cannot quote prove the true faith it's not it's just it's not going to do that work it's a fallacy okay so that's it thanks yeah good question yeah we get that question a lot it's a fair question uh let's see <clears throat> tamara okay so i gave you the mic but we can't hear you um Tavastanag, what's up, Tavastanag? Hey, Jamie. You gotta unmute, man. Icono Matt, ten dollars. Jay, what's up? I was wondering if you plan to debunk Lofton's book. Probably not. I can't imagine that anything in, that's in his book isn't already in a bunch of his boring live streams. Uh, I was the one that made the Michael Lofton joke when you were debating with Jake. Well, that's funny because I actually made the joke to Kai and Lewis in our chat. So I was I was calling. I was saying that Jake was the uh, uh, Muslim Michael Lofton to Kai and Lewis. So. Uh, we had the same vibe there. Travis, $5. This is my first time catching a live stream. I'm a long time viewer. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate that. Um, so guys, remember the way it works is you request to speak. If you request to speak, you come on. Today's topic is not for people who agree. It's for disagreements. And that's why it's listed as a debate stream. It says at the top debate about God, Islam, Catholicism, atheism, Protestantism. 
I don't understand how, like, Sam Shamoon gets, like, a million Muslims that want to debate him. And maybe there's just not a lot of Muslims on Twitter. Like, where are the Muslims that, like, they, none of the Muslims have, I don't remember the last time we had, it's been like, probably eight months since a Muslim came in here. Uh, but they, they love to debate with, uh, I guess because, I guess because Sam will debate the Quranic text. Like, he's like a master at, you know, flipping the, the script on the Muslim about the Quranic text. And uh, not that Sam can't argue the Trinity. It's just that, like, I think the Muslims don't want to come over here because they think, oh, it's just going to be philosophy or something. I don't know. But uh, let's see. We got uh, un, un proletario. What's up, un proletario? Hey, Jamie, could you make me a coffee? This one was really weak. Yeah, this one was like tea. I'm mute. All right, they dropped off. So, <clears throat> Kevin, what's up, Kevin? Hello, hello. Yes, sir. Jay Dyer. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for hosting the space today. Uh, I wanted to come in, represent the Catholic position. Okay. Um, so I guess first off, I want to hear what is the defense of the council of Florence and how do you from the Orthodox side of things determine if an ecumenical council is authoritative or not? Yeah. So, I mean, it's pretty well known if you read the Ostromov book on Florence that, uh, the fact that we had, uh, you know, a handful of patriarchs and bishops there that did accept it certainly doesn't mean that the entire Orthodox Church accepts it. St. Mark of Ephesus famously didn't accept it. And the Orthodox world uh, unanimously rejected the bishops that did accept Florence. So for us, there's no um, like one-size-fits-all easy answer any more than for you. There's a one-size-fits-all easy answer because Roman Catholics, even with the doctrine of the papacy, still don't have a very clear uh, list or idea of what the ecumenical councils are, are namely, the inconsistency that you have uh, with, for example, Lateran 649. Clue me in on Lateran 649 and, and what nuance there you're specifically referring yeah. to. So you know. in the t at the time of the dispute uh, over the monothelite controversy, uh, <clears throat> Rome called a council which intended to be a, a um, independent from the emperor council. So the Pope of Rome called a council. Maximus went... Uh, I've been to the Lateran uh, a few months ago where, where this council was had and <clears throat> they condemned awesome. monothelitism and that's a great thing. And we're happy for that. But that council meets all of the Roman Catholic later criteria for what should count as an ecumenical council. However, when the sixth ecumenical council met, they did not simply state, oh, well, we already have the convenient definition from Lateran 649 from the Pope and Pope Martin. So we don't even have to have an ecumenical council. If they had the Vatican one mindset, they would have simply said Lateran 649 has already solved the issue. But in fact, what they do is they investigate the teachings of the, uh, monothelites, the monothelite patriarch. They investigate the teachings of the Pope of Rome and previous theologians and St. Maximus. And it is not the papacy that is the chief arguer of that council it is saint maximus who is the chief theologian of the sixth ecumenical council so the sixth ecumenical council's lack of citing latter in 649 as a papal decision itself proves that roman catholics don't have a clear coherent but rather an evolving idea of what counts as ecumenical councils and plus the fifth ecumenical council uh the emperor basically made the pope submit to it so once again you have many examples of this kind of thing which shows that you guys don't have it either. And by the way, Vatican II is hotly disputed and uh, very ambiguous when it comes to more and more Roman Catholics themselves now telling me, thank you, that uh, you know they don't believe in, in Vatican II. So what's your epistemic criteria for a universal ecumenical council? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean... Uh, as I would, as I would traditionally say, as a standard, is you know what the Pope says is is, is what goes. Okay, and then why uh, wasn't Lateran six forty nine? And Lateran six forty nine is still not listed by your church as an ecumenical council. Why not? 
I wouldn't know. I, I'd have to look into that specifically. So that's definitely a, a good insight I should look into. Yeah, well, there's a lot I of guess. famous examples like this. So it's not like this is the only one. I mean, there's a whole case of Pope Vigilius. You could watch the debate between Ubi and, uh, uh, is it uh, John? I can't remember if it's John Kolarafi or uh, uh, who's the other Uniate, uh, the old, old hiccup guy that wouldn't debate me because he has hiccups. The Uniate Roman Catholic apologist, the boomer guy, I forget his name, but uh, he and Ubi have a debate over the Fifth Council and Pope Vigilius, and you can see that he didn't fare very well in that debate with Ubi either. Gotcha. Okay, well noted. I'll definitely check those out. I guess so, if, if to simplify then, we don't, on the orthodox side of things, uh, getting back to my original question, we don't really have, like, a finite point where the buck stops uh, when it comes to authoritatively understanding, you know, what makes the ecumenical council authoritative. I guess what I heard from you was. Well, so now you're equivocating because authoritatively pronouncing a council is different from understanding the council. So if you're talking about normative authority, that's a different question from an individual having certitude about what's true or false or what councils are true or false. So those are two different, they're related, but they're two different questions. So for example, we might agree, uh, you and I as uh, Orthodox and Catholic, against a Protestant, for example, that the church in history has normative authority. That means that you and I both agree that there is a historic body of people, post-apostles, who have the ability to make decisions that bind the consciences of believers to some proposition. So we agree there against Correct. Protestants, yeah. right? And that would be called normative authority. However, there's a separate topic in epistemology which relates to individual certitude, and that's where me, you, and Protestants all disagree because we have different accounts of how that comes about. We all agree that at the in the final analysis, me, you, and the Protestants, we all agree that ultimately it's the Holy Spirit that grants and convinces the individual of certitude. But uh, how that comes about, we differ. So for the Roman Catholic, it comes about ultimately through uh, papal fiat and decision. For the Orthodox, it comes about through a combination of means. That would be the liturgy, the lives of the saints, the, the life of the church. Uh, it would be the church fathers, the councils, the scriptures. For us, all of those things work together. So there's no like, there's no one element that we say, oh, this is the thing that is like the ultimate thing. So we think all of those things go together because divine revelation and the one true faith is really expressed unanimously in all of those areas. So there's, there's not, it really makes no sense to pick one of them out as like the thing, right? Because for example, for us, an ecumenical council is not some like magical thing that just had one easy way to identify. Ecumenical councils were part and parcel of the oikumene or the empire. So when there's no longer an empire, it really doesn't make sense to say that there's an oikumene council anymore. But there are, you could say, pan-Orthodox synods. You could say that the Palamites, for us, the Palamite synods have the same status and authority because they've been received basically through the entire Orthodox world by all the patriarchates, etc. So a lot of those kinds of, we think there's a, a multiple tiered thing that you could look at. Uh, for example, the councils refer to previous councils. The councils uh, are in some way referential to the patriarchates and all the patriarchates accepting it and the rest of the church. And also you have the idea of the, the, the theology itself actually being true. So, you know, we have the Robert Council of Ephesus. Well, so do we only know what's the true faith until uh, when, when the Pope says, oh, the Robert Council is false? Or could we identify the Robert Council is false prior to it? Well, I can prove this to you easily because do you think that a Christian in the year 300 had access to what the true faith was if he didn't live in Rome? Yeah, 100%. Okay, well, how? how? How would a Christian in 300 in, say, uh, Ephesus know what the true faith was? Well, I I don't know if I would go so far to say he would completely understand 100% of the nuance of his faith, but would he have... No, just knowing the true faith, right? So let's say I walk into Ephesus, it's the year 300... There's a bunch of different sects, like uh, Irenaeus lists all the different Gnostics. Everybody's claiming to be the one true uh, followers of Jesus. Uh, there is the Orthodox Catholic Church, uh, and then there's other groups and splits and, and whatever's out there. How, how do I, as a, a year 300 person, come to know what the true faith is? Because I don't know what's going on in Rome. It's the ancient world. I can't send scroll emails to Rome to get uh, Pope whoever to answer me really quick to tell me what the truth is. 
Uh, there's no ecumenical council yet, right? We've had, what, uh, 200 plus years of Christianity, no ecumenical council. How do I know what the true faith is? If I'm a Vatican I uh, papist, I can't know. I, I don't know. I have to, literally everybody have to go to Rome or write letters to Rome to know what the true faith was. You see how silly this position leads, what, what, the, what, the, what it leads to? I mean, yeah, I get, I get where you, what you're getting at. Um, I mean, back then, I think how you would know if you were in a true church or not, like Irenaeus or Ignatius imply would be, you know, if you are, if your church is connected to a bishop that has apostolic succession. Okay, but there's plenty of sex and there's plenty of heretics and schismatics like the Novationists at that time that had uh, apostolic succession. Right, but that's exactly why we begin to have councils. I mean, dogmas only seem to rise when there's dispute, when there's confusion, right? Okay, so, but you said earlier that knowing, knowing related to ecumenical councils. But now, in the year 300, knowing the faith doesn't relate to an ecumenical council. Well, correct, because the church, the, church, the church is organic, right? And like I just said, dogmas rise with disputation. Obviously, you know, Justin okay. Martyr... So, ecumenical council... So, right, so knowing the faith is not then tied to having an ecumenical council. Well, it's all about context. It's about the life of the church. The church isn't some like. How does that answer uh, my? How does that answer the objection? Uh, the object. Restate the objection real quick, if you wouldn't mind. So this contradicts what you said a minute ago that ecumenical councils tell us and give us knowledge of the faith. You said uh, infallibly knowing. I forget what what phrase you use. Something like that. So so which is it? Is it that the councils give us? the certitude and knowledge of the faith, or they don't? <clears throat> For sure they do, yeah. Okay, so how would I know in the year 300 what the true faith was? There's no council. I mean, there's local oh, I councils. Mean, we, 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 I mean, we had the Council of Jerusalem, I mean, the Book of Acts. So again, I would say like here in Yeah, but that's in scripture. I don't, I, yeah, but but you're, you're a Roman Catholic and you're talking about, oh, so now you're a Protestant in the year 300? I go to scripture to figure out what the true councils are? Well, I think it would be a Protestant response to say we knew Florence was wrong because all the laymen disagreed. So did I say that? I, I said think, I said the look, rest of the Orthodox world, including the rest of the bishops in the Orthodox world. I didn't say all the laymen disagreed. Sorry, that's what I heard. I heard the Orthodox people disagree, and that's why. And with yeah, Florence, the Orthodox I mean, people is made up of bishops and laity. So you you right, but but the highest degrees of of the bishoprics of the Orthodox no. world. Along you with don't the even understand. There's not this. So Mark of Ephesus, right. Did not go along with it. And there's no, like, okay. it's not like the, you. you're not listening. So you okay. don't understand Sorry. our position. The bishops are all equal. They have canonical privileges. There's no super bishops in the Orthodox church. There. there okay. So that means there's no higher authority. Correct. Within every bishop is the same. And that's correct. Right. So where does the buck stop with authority? I mean, that's that, that seems to be. A you real... understand that that's not a problem. That's a problem everybody has. That's my point. And I illustrated this with how do I know the true faith in the year 300? Is, is that a problem everybody has? How though? do I know the true faith in the year 300? Can you answer this or not? I feel like I have. I, I, what was okay, the I'll... answer? I didn't hear an answer. I heard a bunch of talking around it. What's the answer? All right. Let me, let me answer. Let me answer. And I'll tell you what I've answered. And then please respond. Well, isn't uh, this going to be the answer? Why would you have to tell me when you answered? I just want to get the full the full thought out there. And uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not as given to debate or as gifted as debate with you. So it takes me a little longer to get my okay. articulation across. Okay. So my so I guess my answer to that would be is fundamentally I see the church as something organic, as something alive. Uh, uh, well, I agree with that. Case. I agree with that. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, you know, a, a very simple example, and I'll come around to the full point here. Um, very simple example, you know, Justin Martyr, obviously saint, obviously knew the true faith. Uh, was he completely, um, you know, as perfectly nuanced as we would like to see in the year 2024 when it comes to Christology and Trinitarian theology? No, right? But as the years went by, we had disputations about the Trinity. Therefore, ergo, what ended up happening is we had a council <coughs> that began to solve these things. Mm -hmm. And that's when you saw this pattern happen. Of yeah, but I, I agree with that pattern, totally. Yeah. 
But that doesn't. Yeah. How does that answer the question of the year three hundred, knowing what the true faith is? Well, simply because uh, the, the the true faith continuously extrapolates and and becomes clear as disputation arises. So. Okay, so uh, I, so we don't know the Trinity until people disagree with it. That's a terrible argument. I wouldn't say the average layman would have a as nuanced and as clear of an understanding of the theology pre-Cappadocian fathers or anything like that. Yeah, absolutely not. But did they not have a saving faith that um, they you know they weren't? Yeah, but none of none of this addresses the objection that knowing and ask, asking what the Christian faith is in the year three hundred without access to Rome and without any ecumenical councils disproves your later argument that we need the papacy to know the faith. Um, well, I mean, I feel like that would be getting into another conversation. No, I mean, it's not. It's a perfect uh, way to illustrate the fallacy that you're relying on. Let me give you another example of this same position. At the time of Constantinople I, you mentioned the Cappadocians, and Constantinople I is the Second Ecumenical Council, which gives the Church the doctrine of the Trinity. At the time of the Council being held and at its close, St. Meletius of Antioch was outside of communion with Rome. So he died in schism. The Council of the Trinity was had outside of communion with Rome. And yet, the council was still true. It correctly taught the doctrine of the Trinity that the church accepted. And a couple hundred years later, Rome retroactively accepts that council. So, how does your position reconcile with that fact? Well, simply because, I mean, Rome still ended up accepting that. Obviously. <laughs> okay, and, did and the I council, you, you don't even understand the objection. Did the council correctly teach the Trinity outside of Rome? Yes, 100%. Okay, and your church accepts St. Melidios as a saint, even though he died out of communion with Rome. Correct, yep. Yeah. Which is inconsistent because Unum Sanctum and uh, Florence Cantate Domino, which you just referenced, Florence, says that anyone who dies outside of communion with the Roman bishop is damned. So heretics yeah. and schismatics do a council that correctly teaches the doctrine of the Trinity, and so, therefore, that alone, if you admit that it correctly t that proves us that we proves that we don't need the papacy to know the true doctrine of the Trinity. Well, the thing is, is that we that we still do. I mean, does does the did the you not hear what I just said? Do you, you don't no, understand? I did, no. no, no, no. I, you, I totally can you restate I, to me what the argument is before you move on? Sure. Okay. The arg the argument is, and I'm, I'll put it very simply. Um, you have these councils that correctly defined theology, such as the Trinity, such mm -hmm. as the, uh, you know, St. Melidios, who in fact was in excommunication from Rome mm -hmm. uh, and died so. Mm -hmm. Yet, uh, despite Rome not acknowledging said council or said saint during the lifetime right. of these events, right. they accepted them retroactively. Did the council and, and, correctly teach about the Trinity? Correct, yes. And that was had outside of Rome, right? Mm hmm yeah. So, do we need Rome to know true theology? Yes. Okay, you just contradicted yourself, because you just admitted that they were outside of communion with Rome, they correctly taught and knew the Trinity, yeah, and now yeah, you're yeah, saying yeah. that no. So that's a contradiction. But here, here's, here's the difference in the perspective, Jay. And, and feel free to critique this as well, if you find this erroneous. Yes, did the, did the human who occupied the office of, of the papacy and, and the magisterium itself not recognize the truth as it was right under their noses right then and there? Yes, for sure. No, no, no. That has nothing it, to do... That, it's not about the Pope. It's about the people at Constantinople I. Did they know and recognize the true faith and the true doctrine of the Trinity outside of anything to do with the Bishop of Rome? Have you read Basil's letters, how he bitches about Rome being useless and worthless at that time? So... <laughs> I'm no, serious. Uh, what, what, what letter is this? Uh, I have a whole lecture on ba all of Basil's letters, and I give the lecture. Uh, I give the letter in that lecture. I can pull it out if you really want me to. But the point is that I just love to know what it is to research it if you can. I will give it to you. Yes, since you asked. But the point is that thank you. The point is that the people at the council and the Cappadocians and Miletios correctly knew and stated and defined with nothing to do with Rome. That proves that we don't need the Bishop of Rome to know the true faith. And that disproves all of what you're arguing. And Rome acknowledges that by retroact. Basically, what Jay's argument is, Rome retrospectively acknowledges you don't need Rome by accepting Constantinople I. Does Correct. that make sense? Exactly. 
Right. I understand. I understand the position for sure. But I, I guess what I would say is that the office itself did recognize that as the truth, and it was that office. It, that's irrelevant to what the point is. You, you just admitted that it doesn't matter that it, it recognized it 200 years later because the people at that time didn't need Rome. That's the point. You don't see this? This is obvious. <laughs> the tr- the, the, those people did not need Rome, but that truth needed Rome to be its preserver and its guarantor throughout the ages. No, it didn't. <laughs> that's... In fact, in fact, Pope, in fact, Pope Benedict says that the Orthodox Church has maintained the Christian faith for the last thousand years. So, yeah, thank you. Exactly. Therefore, we don't need Rome to have the faith. So this is Basil's letter. Eighty starts on. Uh, Let's see, 66 to Athanasius of Alexandria. That's where he starts complaining about Rome. And it goes all the way up to letter 69. Seven what to the, 70. What was, the what was the title of that letter again? Letter 66 to Athanasius of Alexandria. And it continues all the way to letter 70. So look at Basil's letter letters. And you'll notice that Everything St. Basil says about Rome is absolutely preposterous when viewed in light of what Vatican I says about Rome. Roger, okay. I and I have a whole lecture on all of Basil's letters, by the way. On your YouTube? Yes. Okay, very good. I'll, I'll, I'll look for those. Well, I, so I just want to say this then. Um, I, un- I understand that they see, you see a contradiction because Certain people had a council. They discovered a truth. Rome didn't recognize it during the lifetime. No, it's not just certain people. It's what the East called an ecumenical council, and they didn't care if Rome accepted it or not. And then Rome retroactively accepted it. So I guess, again, I'll just ask what is the It's the Cappadocians, the very people that you appealed to a minute ago. It's not just anybody. It's Basil, Cappadocians, and particularly Gregory of Nyssa, who was... The, the, you realize that after Constantinople I, the emperor said that if you don't, dis, if you don't agree with uh, Nyssa's theology, you're wrong, particularly on the Trinity. Uh, I, you're right, I, I understand that. But if we get back to my original question, my original okay, question sure. was, how does the Orthodox understand, you know, what is the common common golden thread throughout ecumenical councils that that give them the same normative authority? How do we, un- what's, the, what's the criteria which they're all commonly judged by? Yeah, there's not, you. there's not, there's not a single thing like le- uh, Western people think of and want to identify, quote, ecumenical councils. And that's my point that I brought up earlier that you don't have that in Rome either. So this is really a bugaboo that Roman Catholics like to pull out, which they don't even have. That's my point. So, but we can give you the criteria, what we think identifies authoritative councils. Okay, but, but, but yeah, so what, it, but what is the process then? Because I would say to you, it, it would ultimately be Rome. Rome would be the ultimate arbiter so yeah just asserting your so uh, contrary to all the stuff that i say you just assert the position again and i already gave you examples to where just saying rome it doesn't even work no 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 no. okay okay so So, why is it lateran 649 in ecumenical council i don't i I would have to look into that one specifically i i'm not i'm not equipped to answer that particular so all as per vatican one's definitions it meets all the criteria to be an ecumenical council and yet it's not and do you understand that Roman Catholics themselves have numbered the ecumenical councils differently in history? Well, I know the Orthodox also have disagreement on how particular councils. Yeah, are so so them, this exactly. That, yeah. So th- so this is why this argument doesn't get us anywhere. It's a bugaboo. Well, it do- but the reason it does is because in the Catholic Church we do we do have one head. We do have one decider, the magisterium. The yeah, but you're confused. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't actually do the work. That's my point. So is Vatican II uh, an authoritative council or not? Oh, I'm not. I'm not in the magisterium, so I can't speak on that one. Also, but, well, wait a minute. I thought the pro in the magisterium is to make the laity know the true faith, and so you don't know. No, I don't know about that one, Jay. Yeah, I don't know about that one. So I, okay, so know, the magisterium I, doesn't do the work to actually identify for you what's the true faith and what's not. Well, I would say Vatican II clearly. I mean, I don't. 
we, we, I don't know if I want to get into the debate, the, the weeds of a Vatican II debate. Why not? I mean, I, if, if the principle is that the, pap- the papacy gives epistemic certitude, then that's precisely where we should go because that's the most controversial thing in the Roman Catholic world in the last hundred years. So we've had 70 years of the papacy teaching Vatican II. So obviously it's authoritative from the papacy's perspective. So, you know, do you believe in, do you, okay, so do you believe in religious liberty? Do you believe that, do you believe that Muslims worship God like you do? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay, so you don't follow the magisterial teachings of Rome. Um, I don't know what it would be in Vatican II. I specifically don't follow, but what I I would say. Now, Nostra Tate, Nostra Tate says that Muslims and Jews worship the same God as the Christians. Muslims and Hindus approach God in love and faith and love. Yeah, and love is love, as we all know. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand. I I understand where you're getting at, and I know you're not a miss to the you know to the trad traditional Catholic position or anything like that. I was a trad um, for many years. I know all about it. I lived that world. Right. I, I went to Latin Mass right. uh, for eight years. Right, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I I currently attend um, very traditional Anglo Ordinarian Church. And so, yeah, that's that's awesome. I don't, you know, I could relitigate this with you but I, I think it'd be familiar territory you know again i'm just curious with these councils from the orthodox position what what is the way to determine like what is that single soul criteria i would I there's would not a single that, soul criteria that's my whole point <laughs> that's what i just said there's nothing okay. about this idea that there's an a, there's a magical uh thing that tells you what the ecumenical councils are it doesn't well, exist it it wouldn't be like a magic. It wouldn't be a magic. No, but it's thing. treated that. What I'm saying is, it it's treated that way in the Roman Catholic position because you think that just saying the papacy tells you that. And I just asked you about the most controversial council in the last hundred years, and you say I can't tell you. So well, it, it doesn't is, even do the work for you. Well, I'm, I'm I'm sure you've heard this in traditional Catholic circles, but when you take a perspective on councils and theology and stuff, and I know this isn't a mystical orthodox as well. We don't look at this. We don't look at the span of decades. We look at the span of centuries, if not millennia, right? Okay, well, I mean, so Vatican II is almost a century old. It's like 70 years from, uh, ongoing. Correct, and there's nefarious actors behind it. So we only know Vatican, we'll only, we'll only know Vatican, well, hold on. Pastoral. It won't matter how many centuries go by, though, because it's already confirmed by the papacy, and uh, according to Vatican I, whatever's confirmed by the papacy is dogma. Right, okay, but was, was Vatican II declared infallible? Absolutely. Did it? Did it make any anathemas? I mean, what, what, well, there's nothing. There, there's nothing that says that uh, something has to have an anathema attached to it to be infallible. In fact, I've listed four uh, papal statements about Vatican II being infallible, which I have a whole list. Would you like that list? Sure, but those are all going to be post-Vatican II, correct? Uh, what is that? I mean, the principle in your church that you just identified is the papacy. So it doesn't matter when he says it, pre or post-Vatican II. If, no, it totally it totally matters. No, it doesn't. We'll, think of, well, during the Arian controversy, you just argued that the oh no, you just argued that the papacy. Whoa, 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 whoa! Just one second. You argued that the papacy right. retroactively, two hundred years later, could affirm uh, Constantinople one, and you said that was okay. But if Francis and company yes. retroact or, or post Vatican II say Vatican II is dogmatic, you now you don't have to listen to it. No, I mean I see on the face how that seems like a contradiction, but let me, let me explain myself. Let me explain myself. So the Pope at the time of Athanasius of Alexandria during the Arian controversy, he excommunicated him. Uh, We, we came to learn later that, and I'm not saying this is exactly what's happening now, but I'm on, I'm saying that there are nuances behind the scenes that maybe we're not privy to as the people who are living immediately in those events. But this won't matter. This won't matter because what does Vatican one say about what the Pope confirms for all of the church and for all times? Now, I, I could see, maybe you could say, I see where you're going. You're saying, well, maybe uh, like Vigilius, there was a compelling that the Pope didn't have, you know, free uh, exercise of his will, right? Maybe the Pope uh, was under duress from, I don't know, let's say the CIA went in and said, hey, you're going to confirm Vatican II because we want it. All right. Correct. So theoretically, right. So yeah, I could say, yeah, I, I could see maybe you could have some argument that, that John 23rd or Paul VI did this out of duress. However, the problem is that you can't have 70 years of duress because Vatican I says that the see of Peter will never cease to have an authoritative magisterial successor into the end of the world. And so that, that constituent element of the papacy upholding 
not just dogma, but also the unity and also the preservation can never go away. If it does, then it loses one of its constituent elements. And if and if you haven't read, you know, the, the 15 or so pages of Vatican One, I highly recommend reading it. Yeah, I definitely need to reread it. That's for sure. It's been a while. Um, but I mean, uh, the <clears throat> right. So just just to finish my point. That I think you were at, yeah, you already understood. Under duress, uh, he released it later. St. Athanasius never blamed him for it. Um, yes, it's been 70 years. Uh, is there duress on the Vatican now? Absolutely, and I know you, you wouldn't disagree with that either. What will we know about these events in 100, 200 years? You know, who's to say? I know Vatican Okay, so hold on. So let's say that uh, theoretically, in your model, there was duress for the last... Uh, uh, I don't know, 70 years of the papacy, and therefore we can retroactively cancel all that out. Why does that not open up the possibility of every ecumenical council and papal teaching being subject to duress, and therefore Pius IX of Vatican I was also under duress, uh, and therefore all of it is uh, placed into uh, doubt? Well, that's almost an impossible question to answer, right? Because then we're getting into the specifics of everything. Well, but we're at the point now where you're arguing that we will never know what the true teaching of Vatican II was until two, three hundred years into the future. So really, the, now we're at the point where Magisterium isn't doing us any good at all. Do, do, do you think that in the Orthodox world, and this is a, this is a response um, to what you just said, do you think in the Orthodox world, um, your respective bishops still have questions that need to be answered for the faithful or are there still important disagreements within orthodoxy sure but i but but i don't place uh the epistemic principle being a guy in rome well where but yeah, well, that's exactly my question where is that principle right so the normative authority question is different from the epistemic question that's what you seem to be confusing right so we both agree that there is a body of people within history for us, it's the local Orthodox bishop or Orthodox synods. You understand the church is normally governed by local synods, right? It's not. That's why for 300 years, there is no ecumenical council. Uh, you know, at the time of 300, we don't know what Nicaea will teach because Nicaea hasn't happened yet. And yet we, can, we still know the faith. We still know what the doctrines and dogmas are because it's not hinging there, on what's going on in Rome. But listen. There, there, still, there still was an appellate. A, 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 Structure okay, but so what? Uh, the Alexandria, Alexandria document. Was a council, Alexandria uh, document admits that the appellate structure of the Sardican, uh, you know, can- canons or whatever is not Vatican One. So what you got to demonstrate is that Vatican One is taught in the first thousand years, and that's what no Roman Catholic could do because even the Vatican now admits that the Vatican One view is not taught in the first thousand years. Have you read the Alexandria document? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, so now Rome is admitting about ninety percent of our arguments, a la the Alexandria document. So what does that mean? Uh, sounds like he's sounds like he's bounding. Okay, so now it's Francis, and I can wa- hand wave it because I don't believe I don't care what Francis says. Yeah, but see, that's the thing is that if you uh, if you look at Vatican One, like you don't have the the the, the ability as a Catholic layperson to hand wave Francis. <clears throat> no, I don't. But uh, uh, an immediate pope could. I mean, Pope Honorius, he was condemned heretic. Mm-hmm. At a council by his immediate successor, and and all the other bishops replied. Yeah, and did that. Yeah, and did that. Yeah, but but you has spoken, so that that didn't seem. To no, be you just you just you missed everything that I. That again, that's why Lateran six forty nine is so important because the council didn't just restate Lateran six forty nine, which had already condemned monothelitism. Which if they were papal, that's what they would have done. Rather, they investigate the writings and condemn the pope. So it's not a papal council like you guys want to make it by the mere fact that they didn't just cite letter in 649. I mean, if Vatican I was true, then the Sixth Ecumenical Council wasn't necessary. I feel like what you're saying is, you know, like if we just brought this down to like a very simple judicial system, right? right so in other words, I mean, let's ignore all the arguments and let's just bring it down to something simple. But that's a false analogy because you can't well, make... Well, can, you just hear, can you just hear me? I, you, your breadth of knowledge and, you know, logic and all that is far greater than mine. Obviously, if anything, just help me catch up to you okay. uh, and, and tell me what you think about this simple analogy. Um, so uh, in a basic, let's say two people go to court, they hash out something about for in America, they hash out about something about the Constitution. And, uh, you know, that court rules in favor of the defendant. It gets appealed. It goes to the Supreme Court. 
and then the Supreme Court confirms what that lower court's position was. We would understand that is, yeah, that's exactly how an appellate structure works. Did they discover the truth in that original court hearing at the, at the lower local level? Do you Absolutely. think that the, okay, but it, this analogy doesn't work because as is already admitted in Roman Catholic theologians, the appellate court structure of the canons of Sardica is not Vatican I. So if you're trying to make an analogy, the actual history of the church and the canons of Sardica don't work. Right. Yeah, I, I guess I can't really answer that. Cause I so, Canons of Sardica. If you read the, if yeah, there's a good book by, that discusses this in a whole chapter by Edward Denny. It's called Papalism by Denny, and there's a great chapter on Sardica in there. Ubi also has <coughs> debates where Sardica comes up. <coughs> Sardica calls for uh, another local synod. Oops. Uh oh. That's not papalism because if it was papalism, the appellate structure would not call for another council. It would call for the decision of the Bishop of Rome. I don't know how that necessarily follows, though. I mean, why? Why does it have? To why would we that? have another council if the whole point is that the bishop of Rome can solve it? Well, the bishop of Rome is in some sort of oracle, but if, if push comes, okay. To well, show, then Vatican One is not true because Vatican One <laughs> says that the bishop of Rome is an oracle who solved. You're arguing that he solves the problems. That's the whole point. What do you okay, mean? Okay. All right. Well, hey, you got you got me on that. <laughs> good one. Good one. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I I think you get what I mean. Um, you know, regardless of agreement. Uh, well, yeah, I just think that the the appellate structure analogy uh, has already happened, and it's the canons of Sardica in in the early church, and the canons of Sardica again. I think they're even discussed in the uh, Alexandria document, if I remember. Let me see. I think it even points out that like it doesn't actually do anything to prove the Vatican One view. So May not like. Be. And I know, I know you've handled this one many a time, but refresh me if you would. What, what do you make about the, obviously, the dispute between Kirill and Bartholomew because they're both trying to appeal to a universal authority by, by trying to decide their own diocesan limits outside of the mutually agreed diocesan limits? Yeah, I mean, we... <clears throat> We've had these kinds of problems in the first thousand years of the church where patriarchates were uh, in schism and disagreeing with one another. So, like, how does that, well, what does that have to do with proving whether the papacy is true or not? Well, it would have to do with it because how can either of them claim a universality in their decisions if none of them had a universal claim to begin with? Well, the whole... uh, functioning of orthodox canon law and synods is different than the way that things function in the roman catholic world right so i mean there's a whole process for example as to how this goes about like so for example in our canon law there's stages of canonical discipline the first stage is removal of communion so we're still at the stage where there's no longer communion between Kirill and bartholomew and then the next stages that follow would be like excommunication and so yeah, it's true that you could have a lot of people who, uh, let's say, let's say that let's say the Orthodox Church gets split down the middle. Um, you could have a lot of people who say, "Well, I'm going to side with you know the the EP or whatever." And then, yeah, definitely it would it would probably be a situation where time eventually tells like who's the you know the true true faith and who's the false faith. But if you go to the first thousand years of Christianity. You'll find many examples of where we had schisms like this. And in many of those cases, as referenced by the Miletian schism and what I talked about with Basil, Rome didn't do anything to solve the problem. In fact, Basil complains that Rome is part of the problem. Right. Yeah, and I, I, I would need to read the, the context. Well, it's just, uh, it's, again, it's only, like, it's, it's only like four or five pages of letters. Like I said, 66 to 70, I think. I'll definitely read it. I'll definitely read it for sure. And that was the letter to Alexandria by Basil. The first of the the series of letters on this issue is letter, uh, excuse me, I think it's 71. I might have missed. It's his letter to Athanasius. You know who Athanasius is, I'm sure. Letter to Athanasius. 68. 60. Oh, was this during the Arian controversy? No, it's post the year 371. It's letters. Hold on. It's letter 66. Is letter, this Athanasius of Alexandria he's writing to? Correct. Interesting. Okay. So letter 66, 67, 68, 69, and 70. It's not that long. It's about 
I don't know, maybe seven or eight pages printed out. And he talks about, uh, by the way, you'll notice that he calls Antioch the head church there, which Antioch is not the head. It's just flowery terminology that the church fathers use all the time. He says, I've asked for help from Rome, from the West. They've uh, done nothing. He says that Antioch is the head of the whole body. Uh, again, could we take that out of the context and make it say that the uh, Bishop of Antioch is the head of the whole church? He says that when I've asked Rome to correct the unruly, they've failed. They've failed in the Orthodox faith. They're worthless. They've given no help. Rome has failed to condemn heresies. Rome is ignorant. On and on and on. All he does is talk about how much of a failure Rome is. And uh, yeah, where is Vatican I in any of that? Right. I mean, I would echo those sentiments as well currently. So I Okay, totally but you don't have the liberty of that if Vatican I is part of your dogma. You don't have that liberty. Okay, so if you want to agree with St. Basil, then you're on our side. Because that's not a Vatican I attitude. That's a vatitude. That's not a. That's a vatitude. <laughs> that's not a vat. That's not a vatitude, right? So let's go to uh, decrees of Vatican One, and we read that, and we find out what you actually have to believe in regard to papal supremacy. So you don't have the liberty of doing that. You can't be Orthodox and Roman Catholic at the same time. Are there like a few key lines of Vatican One that you find is most problematic that you could say right now, or does it re- just does go it to <clears throat> go to papalencyclicals.net? and print out the 10 or 15 pages. And you'll see that you don't have the liberty of disagreeing with the papal ordinary magisterial teaching. And in fact, even when it's not magisterial ordinary teaching, even when it's just ordinary, you have to submit with docility to it, even if you disagree. So how do you submit to docility if you go to the SSPX? Right. Well, yeah, and that's just PX. That's canonically irregular. I don't cur- I don't presently go there. Uh, okay, so then you do yeah, submit with docility. Then you do have. Then you do submit. You recognize Francis, and you do submit with docility to his ordinary fallible teaching. Correct. Yes. Well, it didn't sound like in this discussion you were submitting to his ordinary fallible teaching. It sounded like you uh, dismissed a lot of it. Uh, I'm not happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm not happy. I'm not happy with many. Okay, things. so then now you do accept Vatican II. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not really in the position to accept or not accept. Um, well, if you I accept am, Francis sure, sure. now, see, if you accept Francis, you have to accept his teachings with docility. So you do have to accept. It. So you can't play agnostic on Vatican uh, too. Well, well, wait, hold on. I have to accept what's infallibly defined by Francis. And yeah, I'm and ecumenical councils are. Remember, this whole dis, this whole discussion was ecumenical councils, so that's Correct. that's an ecumenical. Any Novus Ordo church that I go to where Francis is is uh, recognized tells me I have to believe in Vatican II. For sure, yeah, and I would I would certainly say that um, there's confusion in the church, one hundred percent. But uh, all right, well, look, hey, there, you get. Go, ahead, go Look, we're going to move on. we got some other people. I'm not trying to be rude to you, but do you have any last... Uh, I'll give you the last comments or, or statements, anything you want to leave us with. Uh, well, I will tell you that, uh, you know, I very much appreciate your work. And, um, you know, you've helped lead me to apostolic Christianity. I started listening to you when I was a Protestant. Uh, and I did explore Orthodoxy. Um, I was going to an Orthodox church for a good eight months. But as, as it currently stands, I'm more persuaded by the Catholic position, but I will be familiarizing myself with Vatican one. Okay. And, uh, I hope to come on yeah. again and, and chat about it. I, I guess okay. if I could just throw one last question and you don't have to give me another comment. That's fine. No, so, go ahead. Sure. Um, so something that I find persuasive as a providential argument, uh, and I just want to understand your take on it is I understand that, you know, from the Catholic position, we see Florence as you, you had the highest, uh, you had the emperor of Byzantium, you had the pope, you had the all the representatives of the Pentarchy sign. Yes, did you have... No, uh, St. Mark of Ephesus bi- didn't sign it. What, did he represent a patriarch or was he just, an, uh, just a bishop? Well, uh, it, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing about patriarch as it makes them magically like, oh, well, it's infallible when all the patriarch gets accepted. I listed various criteria which help us to identify the councils that we accept. But in theory, 
because the patriarchate system arises post Nicaea, I mean, it's theoretically possible for all the patriarchates in orthodoxy to become heretical. Right. I, I mean, I, I find that problematic because that, that why? Would, I mean, that's the Protestant view, right? That's why. They no, only yeah, only, only if you're a Roman Catholic would you think that's problematic because you're attributing to the orthodoxy Roman Catholic presuppositions. So no, there's no pen, there's no five headed infallible monster that runs the Orthodox Church. <laughs> they yeah, just rep they just represent big C. Infallible Hydra. Look, so a patriarchy represents a big C, a big that's it, a big jurisdiction, and the only thing that patriarchates have that regular bishops don't have is privileges within their cano their their canonical jurisdictions. And for example, in the councils, Rome might be considered first, and you'll notice that Rome is considered first, and then. The other patriarchates are movable, right? So it's movable in the history of the first thousand years of Christianity because eventually, even though it's controversial, at Constantinople I, uh, uh, Constantinople is considered to be second. And that move is challenged by uh, Pope Leo, not on the basis of anything to do with papism, but Pope Leo says it's not fair to Alexandria, a la the canons of Nicaea, because Nicaea put Alexandria second. But eventually the Bishop of Constantinople is accepted as second to Rome. So you understand that these positions are movable canonical positions. And I don't have the view. I've never seen any argument as to how, like, I mean, is it possible for all, for all the patriarchates to become heretical? Well, if we didn't have the patriarchates in the year 300, uh, you know, all five of them, I don't understand why it would be essential to the Orthodox Church that we have quote, five patriarchates. It's just a canonical development that is fine and good and helpful for certain times. But even the patriarch Constantinople, for example, like he only has underneath him nowadays, like a few thousand people, right? In his actual like local jurisdiction. Like it's, it's, it's minuscule compared to, you know, hundreds of millions of people a la Russian Orthodox Church or something like that. So it's like a lot of the patriarchate stuff in the Orthodox Church I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm just saying that canonical stuff, synodal stuff, that's what it's about. It's not a five-headed, it's not like five little popes versus one big pope. Right, yeah. I, I, under, I understand what you're saying. Just to finish the whole picture um, and yeah, challenge any of my presuppositions within this, as you may. Um, yeah, as the Catholic see Florence... Yeah, we see the emperor, we see these higher bishops, and I understand what you just said, just to finish the point. Um, signing on, and... You understand and, the rest of the Orthodox world rejected it, though. I, yes, I, so, I understand. The, and and also, lady, let me give you one example. Let me, <laughs> there's something, there's something you're missing. Finish? Hold on, before you go on, on you can say whatever you want, yeah. but before you go on, there's okay. an important mistake you're making, which is... You took issue with, for example, laity having anything to do with this in terms of reception. So when I said the rest of the Orthodox world, I meant the rest of the Orthodox world's bishops and laity. So in the Orthodox Church, there's a big difference between us and you, which is that laity have a very important role in also receiving and accepting doctrines and dogmas from synods, councils, or bishops, or patriarchs. And this is very different because you think, well, that doesn't make any sense because, you know, what a lady don't know anything. They shouldn't. No, no. They have an absolutely important role. And we, we need to only look to the uh, examples that you also have to accept in your own church of the Seventh Ecumenical Council and the icons. So you may not be aware of this, but in the Seventh uh, Ecumenical Council, there were many, many patriarchs. Well, there are several patriarchs and bishops who believed in iconoclasm and there were other handfuls that did not believe in iconoclasm they were iconoduls so the but the locus of the church's defense of iconodualism was not from the patriarchates it's not even necessarily from the bishop of rome although initially he did sign off correctly on the right position just of images itself in fact, it was the laity and the monastics that saved the day in the uh, iconoclasm controversy. So there's actually key examples of where corrupt bishops in iconoclasm, same as in Arianism too, by the way, where uh, corrupt bishops tried to force the church to accept uh, iconoclasm, and it was the laity that played a very key role with the monastics in rejecting that. So that's an example that's applicable to your church, because that's first thousand years, you think that's Roman Catholic, then you have the same thing going on in the iconoclasm controversy that you're faulting me for pointing out in Florence. Right. 
Mike. Okay, so <laughs> thank you for that. Really, I do appreciate that. And I'm taking all that to heart. Um, so again, just to finish the point, um, <clears throat> yeah, so what we're taking issue with, like you see in many ecumenical councils, you always have dissenting bishops uh, and other clergy. You always have a small remnant. And this is me quoting, I believe his name, Bishop Timothy Ware. He himself said Florence seemingly has all the marks of an ecumenical council. Um, and you had, um, cool. Can I, can I quote James Martin too? Or will you, what, what do you think? So like, so what do you accept James Martin? No, no, I don't accept James Martin, but okay. So a bad argument in Timothy where, what does that mean? Well, it's just a bishop. So that whatever that means to anybody, I don't know what it means to the Orthodox position. That's what I'm still confused on. Um, oh, come like on. You, you know that because a, a bishop says something bad, that's not a good argument against. I can, I can find a thousand Roman Catholic bishops saying ridiculous things every day. So what is that? That doesn't, that doesn't do anything. That's a two, do you know what a two quote way is? Do you know what a two quote way is? Uh, two quote way, like uh, rules for me, not for me. Kind of, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I hear what you're saying. I don't want to get into the weeds of another little argument i just want to try to get all this out so the providential argument i'm coming to is uh what you end up happen have happening is yes you had a a small minority dissenter uh dissenting from florence um uh, which we would find you know arbitrary and i know you wouldn't no, no, you, again you're misunderstanding so you understand that wait, there's wait, 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 wait. So it's not a minority. It's just that's not that's false. You understand that the rest of the Orthodox world is the majority, and they rejected this. So it's a minority okay, that's at Florence. Okay. So you're totally wrong. Sure, sure. Okay. Sure. Majority in the wider Orthodox world. Minority as far as the Orthodox representatives. That's true. Counts. That's correct. Okay. Yes. We're in agreement. We're in a total agreement there. Okay. Um. So. Uh. And you had yeah. Okay. So. Anyways. Uh, and they were, I think, in a official union for, what, a generation, 50, 70 years or something like that, before the Muslims came in, killed. Correct, killed right. So Emperor. Byzantium fell when it was uniate, correct? Yes, it fell. So, it, yeah, it fell. It fell during then when the people, right, and, okay, yeah, you would see that as a punishment for being uniate. Well, I mean, I don't make dumb providential arguments because they're they're low, they're stupid. They don't prove anything. Well, come on, come on now. Pro- providence is totally biblical. Uh, no, but providence, providence is biblical, but reading into providence, uh, punishments and judgments. Have you read City of God? You understand Augustine makes fun of this whole idea because the Roman pagans were arguing that Rome fell because they accepted Christianity. And uh, Augustine says that this is a dumb argument. So I'm just simply saying that I agree with Augustine. This is a dumb argument. Well, hey, hey, Augustine also is pro filioque, so... You know. What does that have to do with the point that I just made about uh, his argument against providential, quote unquote, arguments that Rome fell because of Christianity? You understand that it can be interpreted in any different way, right? I mean, you could argue that, uh, I mean, why can't I argue then that uh, it fell because it was uniate? You see how arbitrary this is? It's silly. I mean, I Pius, the, so I let me argue I, that I, Pius, I, Pius I, the Ninth I, was, Pius the Ninth was uh, I, imprisoned I, in the, he was imprisoned in the Vatican. Therefore, uh. Therefore, that was a punishment providentially, and Vatican I is false. You see how silly these arguments are? That is such a, that's Napoleon, right? When Bonaparte put him hostage? Well, the, the Masons took over in Italy, and the Pope was uh, imprisoned in the Vatican. So is that a punishment that disproves Roman Catholicism in Vatican I? You see how arbitrary these interpretations of history can be? I think the differences of scale would... So this dude, a, you understand how that, you understand how philosophically absurd that is. So now it's arbitrarily a quote scale. Where do you get the scale from? I, I think it's just okay, arbitrary. Where, where, where do, hold on, where do I get the scale from? You had you had the majority of the lady and the lower clergy reject Florence, and they rejected the council. And what you had happen was every single patriarchate fell under domination. Of Muslim rule. So, so why can't I argue that, that Florence a, that Florence fell because it was union? Apostolic originating. So this is this is all be, it's, be, it's, be, all, be, oh, here, it's all arbitrary. Here, here, here's 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 why Jay. Here's why Jay because the Orthodox world has continued to be Orthodox, not uniate, 
And they still are under this burden. Yeah, but and, and Pope why. Benedict says that that he says that the Orthodox have maintained the faith for the last thousand years. Okay, which is which is totally kosher as far as Catholic theology because. No, yeah, that means that we don't need to. That means that being under the being, that means that being under the papacy doesn't prove. I'm excuse me. That means that being under the papacy doesn't give us the knowledge of the true faith, and it also means that being under Muslims doesn't mean that we lose the true faith. No, no, no. Because a schismatic is different from a heretic, and I know you you understand this. A schismatic what is, is someone that? who can be orthodox in all their teaching, but a schismatic is someone that doesn't. And that doesn't. No, and by the way, that's a mistake because in uh, the teachings of Leo the Thirteenth and Pius the Twelfth, and in your own canon law, uh, a schismatic uh, is outside the body of Christ. So it doesn't matter whether you're, I know there's a difference between a schismatic and a heretic, but both are equally outside the church. So that that doesn't apply. That doesn't. I mean, that's all. I don't, no, I don't know how that would... Because a schismatic and a heretic are equally outside of the church. So the argument doesn't hold. Well, I understand that, but you can still be orthodox in your teaching as a schismatic because the thing that makes someone a schismatic as opposed to well, then, a heretic then, then, is the fact okay. that they are orthodox in their theology, but they, they reject uh, the authority structure that we see as Christ establishing. With the Catholic Church, right, and then so what? Fran or what Benedict says is that the uh, Orthodox have maintained the faith, and therefore the faith doesn't need the papacy to be maintained. Okay, right, but they're still. <laughs> so none of this they're proves Catholicism is the point. These are bad arguments, is the point. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I think I got the full point out there. Um, uh, but why? Know, why? Days. Okay, but hold on. But if we're going to use these providential arguments, do you not understand that it's yeah. arbitrary? If uh, when I point out that Byzantium fell when it was uniate? Well, I don't think that's well, I, what I would again respond to you with is if it had to do with it being uniate, then why is why are those places that fell way back when on the? And I forgot to mention this piece, and I know this probably bug you, but. On the day of Pentecost, on the feast day of the Holy Spirit, after a council that was deciding the filioque, among other things, you know, these places have continued to be under Muslim rule, even though their rulers are, as you would say, orthodox and not uniate. So obviously, if this wasn't okay, so by this argument, that by this argument, all of the Western European nations, which are now falling to Muslim dominance, that also now disproves the papacy because when I go to Europe. It's uh, Muslims everywhere. So now, you see how silly these arguments, these are terrible arguments. I mean, have you been to Europe? Uh, I, I think, I think. Have I think you been to Europe? The, yes. When? I, I, I've seen the kebab shops in Berlin. I, I know what you're talking about. No, I'm talking, you're right. And, and it's everywhere, right? It's not just, uh, right. So there's what, gigantic hordes of Muslims in Italy too. I was just in Italy three right. months ago. Okay. So, yeah, we're, uh, we're so, 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 so there we go. So, so there we go. God has punished and cursed the Roman Catholic Church because the Muslims are winning now. See how bad these arguments are. I would say if that's where the nuance ended, for sure, I would see how that's a bad. Well, argument. if we got to go into we nuance, can't, we can't really, we can't really get into <laughs> open immigration on this platform, though. I wouldn't want to. Well, you said scale, and so what's the scale of uh, the rise of Islam in Europe versus Catholicism? So now scale doesn't apply. I mean, the, okay, well, the scale you're talking about is on an incredibly small, incredibly small time frame. Oh, uh, so now it's scale of time, not scale of numbers. Yes, correct. I mean, the, the, the more time, the more witnesses you have attesting to a particular reality, the more weight and gravity it's given. So it just gets more and more qualified and more and more arbitrary, right? Because because when, when you're trying to flesh out why we should believe that this is the proper way to interpret the providential punishment, you understand that the more I drilled into it, it got more and more nuanced, qualified, and arbitrary. And so now it's just, oh, well, it's only uh, the scale within this time frame of the quantity of this con this many converts. within. And so it's, it's just arbitrary. How is this argument not uh, arbitrary? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what the fundamental issue is with nuance. I mean, nuance is how you... I don't have a problem with the word the nuance. It's the nuance of it becoming now a small time frame and certain numbers. Right. I, I mean, what I'm saying to you is I, f I find those things persuasive. Uh, well, and yeah, but I mean, people find bad arguments persuasive all the time. So, yeah, that's possible. 
That's just a joke. It's just a joke, man. It's no, just no, a I joke. Know, I know, I know. Don't, you can't hurt my feelings, Jay. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, I'm too much of a super fan, so never happened over here. But, um, well, yeah, man. I, hey, listen, I... I just think this was a this was a great great conversation. It was a great conversation. I, I appreciate you keeping it very uh, civil and cool. Uh, uh, you get a great A on your demeanor. It was a lot of fun. By the way, is that Bono? I, I, like I see the profile image. Is that Bono? It looks like Bono. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just uh, that's just me, man. That's me. Uh, okay. Just found some rose colored shades. <laughs> <laughs> Funny years ago, put them on. Okay. That's the story. Nothing. Well, thanks, Kevin. You're, you're welcome to come on anytime, bring any more uh, questions, objections that you have. I would say specifically <coughs> on Florence, there's a good book by Ostromov, O-S-T-R-U-M-O-V. That's a really good book to read. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, oh, hey, hey, one last question. Are you still running your philosophy course? Yeah, it's uh, <coughs> it's available through uh, uh, Richard Grove's uh, Autonomy uh, Agora Marketplace. So, yeah, it's still available. Okay, this is a super random suggestion, uh, and I don't. I'm not. I don't work with these people at all. Highly recommend checking out school.com, s k o o l dot com, to host the course on. They're doing a competition right now mm-hmm. um, that I think you'd be really interested in as someone who's selling a compelling inf- in- information product. Okay. So I, I just recommend you check that out. <coughs> I'd love to see your program uh, propagate. All right, yeah, I'll check that out. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Yeah, that was a great conversation there. Really good, civil. It's always great to have a, you know, a, a, a heated but civil conversation with Roman Catholics. I appreciate that. So he gets an he gets an A plus on uh, interaction there. He didn't, uh, and bo- both of us kept it civil. I think so. It was heated but fun. Uh, now this guy's been sitting here waiting. Uh, Jonghua, what's up, Jonghua? You've been waiting a long time, so I guess I'll go to you. What's up, y'all? Thank you for the super chats. Uh, non, go Hello. ahead, dude. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. What's up, man? What's on your mind? Yeah, my problem is the um, the dark argument leading to the to the Trinity, uh, leading to the, the the God of the Christian Orthodox. Yeah, so <clears throat> I got a bunch of videos where I talked about how I'm just gonna reti- retitle those videos. Um, how does uh, tag lead to Trinity? Because that would be a lot easier. Because this question gets asked like every day. Uh, Jose, what's up, Jose? <clears throat> Greetings from Germany. Uh, net infection. If somebody believes in Asian philosophy. Have you ever debated? We had one Buddhist guy we did a debate with on a live stream maybe two years ago. You can find that. Um, But those positions don't typically debate. People are always like, when are you going to debate a Hindu? When are you going to debate a a Buddhist? Okay, They don't typically debate because they're not missionary faiths typically. Sometimes uh, maybe Hindus. Well, they're a little bit missionary. But Jews also don't typically engage in debates that much. I've had one or two Jews ever come on discord to debate so for for whatever reason that they, they typically don't I think we had one jewish guy maybe two months ago pop on so <clears throat> also not a missionary based faith uh <clears throat> i've been debating them and it's hard to debate them because they say shamanism is bad because you believe in jesus well i mean i think we can have better critiques than that for example most of those far eastern religions fall into some form of monism or maya and those are really positions that are destructive to the possibility of knowledge so if you you just just critique it by you know if you, if you deny basic logic which most far eastern positions do then you're not really you're not really be able to say anything kishore madurai ten dollars how's it going i love your content you help me understand the orthodox theology uh will you unblock me on instagram i don't know i mean i don't know who you are and typically when i block people on instagram i have good reason to do it um so um I mean, is that your handle on Instagram? So I don't even know. <clears throat> I guess I can look and see. And uh, maybe since you sent a super chat. Lilac Flower Days, $3. I found your videos a few days ago. I'm working through them. I'm not orthodox. I'm looking forward to learning more. Well, thank you, Lilac. Appreciate that. Hope you hope you find uh, the information edifying. Jeff Coombs, $3. What's the difference between Protestant teaching of sanctification and theosis? 
Are they saying the same thing? No, I think there's a big difference between, I mean, we, we both might have the same ideas that we want to morally be better and we want to acquire virtue, but we're saying very different things by how that's had, right? As you saw, Redeem Zoomer at the beginning of this video said that it's created grace. Well, that's fundamentally absurd to an Orthodox person. So I think as St. Seraphim says, uh, Serov says that the whole of the Orthodox life is the acquiring of the Holy Spirit. And that means uncreated grace. That's what theosis means. So it's not a mere sort of Protestant moralism where we're just trying to like uh, engage in some kind of self-help, uh, self-betterment program. It's actually uh, acquiring the virtues and the life of God. Uh, Jose, what's up? Are you there? I'm here, bro. What's up? Hey, do you have a disagreement or a uh, argument? No, I just wanted to ask when you, when we could find you on uh, TikTok again. Yeah, somebody said in the chat uh, you would get a lot more interactions for this if you did TikTok. That's true. Uh, however, yeah, it is so yeah, uh, so low tier, dude. Like it's so hard to. I mean, people don't even understand. Like, if you really want to test your patience, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm serious, man. It's it's so hard. Actually, maybe I should do it because it's like training in virtue or whatever. <laughs> like, like to to test your patience on TikTok is a big challenge. So it's, a, it's like double XP weekend on uh, virtue training. I mean, you, you just, uh, you don't understand until you do it. People hear me saying this. Uh, I mean, it's just like people screaming and just, it's crazy. It's, it's like, a, it's a madhouse dude. So it's hard for me to, to put up with it, but it does get a lot of views and it does get a lot. People love that. It's almost more like blood sports. It's not really a debate. So I don't know. Uh, do you have a, do you have a question? I mean, uh, you get the occasional, uh, you know, high tier. Debate. Yeah, there have been a few, like we, that. There's a, a Calvinist guy that has really good questions about Bonson. He has Bonson as his profile, yeah. and uh, he had a lot of good Christology questions. And you get you get a lot of Muslims. So if you want to really tap into the Muslim sphere, you definitely should do uh, TikTok. Yeah, I just uh, need to get more more ops there. And then last thing, uh, could you do just a quick off the cuff, you know, one or two line refutation to these three different uh, real quick. Uh, I mean, I can try, but I don't know if, if it's sufficient to no, do a one-line response. Just, you know, just straight off the bat, uh, evolution. Yeah, I typically critique evolution from a philosophical perspective. Like, I'm not trained in uh, biology or, you know, geology. So I don't, I don't usually go into that domain. I'll talk about some of those arguments, but typically when I refute philosophy, it's from, or uh, evolution is from a philosophical perspective of, that there's not really sufficient evidence or uh, any way to prove that everything came from one thing or that there is a transmutation of species. Usually the arguments are, uh, well, but, uh, you know, there was adaptation uh, in this one instance. So therefore, over billions of years, there would be mutation in a totally different species. Yeah, but that's the thing that's in question, right? So that's a huge leap that I don't see as justified. Uh, I mean, there's all there's other approaches that you could do to evolution. I mean, it just depends on how uh, how far they're taking their evolutionary theory, right? Some people might think evolution means everything is in an evolutionary flux. Well, if everything is in evolutionary flux, then the proposition that everything is in evolutionary flux is also an evolutionary flux, and therefore self-refuting. Yeah, so it just depends on yeah. what type of person we're talking to. <clears throat> uh, monism. Well, if everything is one, then uh, I could never know that everything is one because my coming to know everything is one is particular and discrete and therefore not, uh, and, and, is, and is therefore one, so it's illusory. Gotcha. And then last one, uh, non-dualism, sir. Well, non-dualism is a form of monism, so what does that mean? It's a form of monism. Okay, yeah, never mind. That's well, I mean, it depends on what you mean by non-dualism. I mean, there might be a non-dualist view of epistemology, a non-dualist view of the soul. I mean, what do you mean by non-dualist view of uh, you know, metaphysics? Just be more precise. What do you mean? Yeah, like metaphysics, typically speaking about like, you know. Well, that's just monism. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. <clears throat> um, I think <clears throat> Uh, I want to remind you guys, too, that we do have a show sponsor. Uh, we're not quitting yet. Um, if you guys want to pop back on, uh, there's definitely time for more. But I want to remind you that our sponsor is Chalk.com, the best in supplementation. Head on over to Chalk.com. Get a hold of this Tonkatali proven to boost testosterone. we got a bunch more super chats to cover. I want to remind you guys to also uh, head on over to Lore Coffee. You see the Lore Coffee behind me. That's a 100% orthodox 
Coffee Distributor. Their link is also in the show description so you can support Lore Coffee there. And let's hear a little bit about our based sponsor. You see that right there, chalk.com? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's go check out what they have to say. Chalk.com, and I'll be right back as I go TT once again. I'm going to put you on something oh, crazy just... real quick. Most of these Zuma Gym Bros are consuming macro-guzzling synthetic dyes and synthetic sweeteners on the daily. They don't even know it. Goofy AF. There's nothing great about that. Do not listen any further unless you are an alpha or sigma male. This is important and there could be consequences. There's a new certified sigma male pre-workout powder for sigmas only. It is guaranteed to empower you to dominate your co-workers, fire your boss, aggressively gamble, or invade a small village. Chad Mode stands out from the crowd by excluding artificial flavors, preservatives, sweeteners, and dyes. We've even avoided so-called natural flavors, which are actually not natural at all, ensuring a clean and effective formula. Experience the pure goodness of Chad Mode, colored with organic blue spirulina extract, organic lemon, cherry, and organic maple crystals. Forget synthetic caffeine made in a sketchy Chinese lab, embrace the natural power of organic green coffee bean extract, which will get your mind going and pump you up to the max. Chad Mode is made in America with all clean ingredients, the first clean pre-workout of its kind. Why are these people adding synthetic sweeteners to every single pre-workout when there are many studied downsides to consuming nasty fake sucralose? Each dose of Chad Mode contains the kick of a cup and a half of coffee, delivering a surge of energy alongside essential vitamins, minerals, amino acids, and herbal extracts. Chad Mode will allow you to fire your boss and dominate anyone who opposes you. Chad Mode will make you more dominant in your daily life, so proceed with caution. It's as simple as mixing one or two scoops of our fine powder into water or juice, providing you with a delicious energizing beverage featuring a burst of sweet organic fruit flavor. Chad Mode will give you the extra edge you desperately crave. Don't miss out secure your supply of Chad Mode on TikTok shop with a limited time. Ma yeah, so remember to head on over to Lore Coffee there. The link is in the show description. Uh, and then let's see, we got Ellie since $5. Thank you, Ellie. Appreciate that. Holivar, $5. I don't have Twitter, so I'm going to ask you here. Can we trace the idea of post-apostolic ideas of, of ecumenical councils being infallible? Um, Athanasius speaks of Nicaea as the, the Holy Spirit speaking. So, I mean, that would kind of be the equivalent of that. Uh, yeah, the way Athanasius speaks of Nicaea. What about a council condemning one person? Uh, Theodore Cyrus. Yeah, there's a, I mean, there's a lot to say about ecumenical councils leaving certain questions open. For example, Chalcedon is an ecumenical council, but Chalcedon didn't satisfy and settle all the Christological disputes and debates that were going on at that time. And that's precisely why the fifth council happens. And so the fifth council happens to uh, distinguish, to, to actually be more clear about what Chalcedon left unclear so that doesn't mean that ecumenical councils are wrong it just means that there's going to be questions that by the nature of them being at one space at one point in time that they don't answer everything and if you read any of the literature the academic literature on the fifth council and particularly you know the rise of in hypost in hypostaton and how it's used by uh, leontius of jerusalem and how it's accepted at the fifth council etc then we begin to see that this is the next layer of clarification that happens post Chalcedon. So um, I think that helps to explain what's going on with Theodoret um, and the idea of a work being condemned and people, individual people being excused and so forth. Uh, Ender $5, Cyber Polygon happening today. Um, I saw people talking about internet being out, but uh, no internet outage or cell phone outage has affected me today so uh, maybe they're running some kind of test test run for something uh, I, I haven't looked at the news today so i don't even know what's happening today i saw lord voldemort talking about the uh fbi warnings of whatever about uh chinese hacking or something I, but i haven't even seen the news so uh, literally today all i've done is think about what we're talking about here um, I'll have to look and see. Banjo, I wouldn't be surprised though. I mean, we know some kind of crazy events are coming. 
we've been talking about this for the last six months, right? Of what crazy events are coming in 2024. We've been speculating. We've listed the various possibilities. Um, you know, cyber pandemic, uh, another coup, economic collapse, uh, riots. You know, we talked about all kinds of different possibilities, and we don't know. I don't know what it's going to. Could do, maybe they'll do like two or three of these. Right? Who knows? Banjo Fields, ten dollars. What's the argument about Luke nine forty nine? Um, whoever is not against you is for you. Yeah, he also says that that guy will also, whoever's not against us will also be one of us. So the assumption is that that person would not continue to just operate, um, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Lone wolf. <laughs> He's not going to continue to work uh, lone wolf because if you read the book of Acts, you'll notice that Paul, I'm trying to get this to focus again, it goes out of focus. Thank you. <clears throat> When Paul goes out and he finds people that are uh, disciples of John or people who are less instructed, he doesn't immediately call them heretics. He treats them as brethren and then invites them to become under the episcopate. I think this is Acts 9 and like Acts 18, somewhere in there. So uh, go look at those examples. And there's really good notes in the Orthodox Study Bible when it comes to those chapters. So um, Ethan, $5. Are you familiar with the medieval French mystic Marguerite? Porite. I'm not. What do you think about her? No idea. Uh, I, I can't imagine, though, that as Orthodox, we have much of an interest in medieval French mystic women. Father Deacon Patrick, $10. Could a two-minute dialogue with Boomer Garcia happen in Nam? Uh, well, not for $10, but thank you for that, Father Deacon Patrick. But maybe... Maybe, let, let's see, we could channel, <clears throat> oh, yeah, you know, man, when I was over in Nam, uh, you know, we had a lot of hard times out there, you know, when I was in the in the tunnels that the Viet Cong had dug, you know, I was down there and I found what I thought was a couple of, oh, you know, maybe like old McDonald's wrappers or whatever, and I says, hey, how did the heck does the, does the Viet Cong get the McDonald's wrappers in their tunnels, and then, boom, a bomb goes off, next thing I know, I'm waking up on a, uh, on a platform flying me out of Nam and I'm on a vision quest to another dimension and then I came back into my body and I realized that uh, it was just a dream when I was laying over there uh, waiting for the Hemis to come over the... Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know where I was going with that one. I don't even know what a Hemi is. The motorcycle, like a helicopter, I guess, right? Is that, a, is that a helicopter? I don't know. How's that? That's what you get for 10 bucks. Slowest boy, $3. I've heard you say conditional statement if Jesus rose from the dead, that proves the religion true. No, never made that statement. Uh, you must have totally misunderstood me because I said <clears throat> that if Jesus rose from the dead, then that means some type of uh, miraculous event occurred, right? And many religions might claim a resurrection or they might claim some sort of miracle. But the miracle only has the meaning that it has in the context of the rest of the religion, right? I mean, uh, Elisha, his bones raised someone from the dead. So raising from the dead itself doesn't tell us that it has the meaning of Messiah or right, whatever, right? So it's in other words, it's, a, it's part of the truths that are part of the whole context. You need the rest of the Christian religion of Jesus being the Messiah the son of David and what the meaning of resurrection is. And that's why just resurrection arguments don't work. So I've never argued that. I mean, I've, I learned this argument was bad when I was 20 and I've never made this argument. So you must've, your name is slowest boy. So you must've misunderstood as a slow boy. That's okay. I'm not dissing you. We can help you become a fast boy. You said miracles don't prove the truth of religion. Correct. They attest to it. They don't prove it. So what proves the truth of Christianity? The transcendental argument is the best logical proof but I think that miracles occur and they attest to it. They can become evidences, but evidences are not strict proofs because the resurrection of Jesus as an evidence only has the meaning that it has with the rest of the Christian religion. That should be obvious. Anonymous $3. Uh, you don't believe we're in the end times, you said. I said, we don't. I don't know that. So again, uh, people just coming out with uh, accusing me of positions that aren't my positions. Saying that I don't know that if we're in the end times does not equate to we are not in the end times. So two different things. Why do you think that? Are there saints that take a position on it? Well, I mean, there's saints that take various positions on different things. So uh, if some saint thinks that we're in the last days, it doesn't mean it's true. 
everything points in that direction. I could be, but I mean, I think you're uh, getting ahead of yourself if you're, you know, assuming that you know, oh, we are in the end times. Maybe. Uh, Double O Honeybee, $100. Thank you so much. Always dropping those fat super chats, winning the super chat contest. Appreciate that. Orthodox sold $5. Dedicated video, maybe to exhaustive explanation of the distinction between epistemic certitude and normative authority. Um, yeah, maybe we should, but I mean, we've, I mean, if I've covered that like 30 times on 30, uh, open forums, it's like people, if they really want the answers, they can go back and kind of watch that. I mean, G Gub does literally a timestamp for every live stream. I mean, he like, <clears throat> you know, he churns it out. So thank you for that. Uh, if you guys want access to the books, remember you can uh, go to the website, get copies of my philosophy books, my Hollywood books, the Red Book. Remember also, you guys got to get <clears throat> tickets to our live event in Hollywood. I don't know why everybody isn't just immediately jumping on this. It's going to be amazing fun because how, when else are you going to be able to come and meet Jamie Kennedy and then immediately go and uh, have a debate with me. If you want to come debate me, I don't care. You come debate and then come over here. We got five hours of talk lecture, five hours of entertainment, five hours of bring your theology questions or geopolitical questions, your whatever. Just come get your uh, ticket right here at the event, right? You can see it right there. And it's not, just for California bros. If you live in the Vegas area, you can come over there as well. If you live in, uh, there's the link for the tickets right there. <clears throat> I will be covering geopolitics, espionage, and orthodox metaphysics. Jamie will be covering, Jamie, my wife, will be covering uh, Hollywood witches and bitches, Hollywood witchcraft, Hollywood bitchcraft. Uh, Jamie Kennedy will be doing stand-up. And he's a lot of fun. We had a great time. So it's not what we did at the last LA event, what, eight months ago. This is a different, all different material. Okay. So don't think that, well, I already saw this. No, no, no. This is all different. And it's going to be like a five hour nerd party. I mean, wh where are you at? Why aren't you here? Get your ticket now. Go ahead. Sign up right there. Eventbrite. There's the link. And let's see. I've got another super chat here. <clears throat> Ricky, $5. Can you do the, I'm so pious that you should be praying and not to pay. I am so pious that I don't understand why these people would go onto the internet and not post their prayers. Jesus says very clearly in the Sermon on the Mount to make sure that you stand on the, cre the, the street corner of Twitter and tell everybody when you're praying and that God would bless you from heaven. And if you're debating, then you're not as pious as me. How's that? Is that what you wanted? Uh, let's see. Somebody else wants to come on. Flame 2. Get your tickets, y'all. March 15th, Friday night. That's even better than last time. Last time was like a week night. We still got 100 people. So get your tickets right there, March 15th, Friday night. Hello? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay, so I have two questions. Um, I'm not debating you, I can't do that. But I have two questions and they're kind of uh, connected. So um, the first, um, would you rather I ask them one at a one, I ask one question and you answer, or do I, do I just put, do I just ask both of them? Do it however you want. Okay, so I'll just say both of them. Okay, so after his resurrection, why did Jesus need to ascend so that the Holy Spirit could descend? When both were existing at the same time, when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit was present with him. Um, had he stayed and started his thousand-year kingdom then, the whole world would be Christian, the church wouldn't be divided, as the authority would default okay, to what down, Jesus slow down, slow down. So let's, hold on, let's answer the first yeah, sorry. one. It's okay, so let's answer the first one. So right. it has nothing to do with whether the Holy Spirit was omniscient or like he wasn't here. It has to do with the mode of his presence. The Holy Spirit was not present in the mode of empowering the church at Pentecost. So that's why Pentecost is something new. So it's a new mode, a new empowerment and presence that is not present prior to that in the same way. So we say the same thing, for example, about Jesus. Jesus is omnipresent, but 
the unique mode of his incarnation is different from just being omnipresent. So, for example, when Jesus was walking around in Jerusalem, he's present in Jerusalem in a unique way that's not identical to his presence in the rest of the world through his omniscience. So both are true at the same time, but it's a new mode of presence. So when he ascended, he, he achieved that new mode of presence. No, I just said that when he was incarnate, he was in a unique mode, a new mode of being in the form of man, as scripture says. So the incarnation is his entering into the kenotic state, kenosis, a new mode of being. The Pentecost descent is the new mode of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the whole point of his ascension was so the Holy Spirit could descend. No, there was a multiple, no. many points to the ascension. For example, in the book of Hebrews, in chapters uh, 6, 7, and 8, that describes the cleansing that he would do in the typological fulfillment of the high priest's entrance into the Holy of Holies when he would sprinkle the mercy seat. That was typologically the ascent of Christ into the third heavens, the true Holy of Holies, to cleanse the way in our nature for us. So his assumption of our nature to then go into the presence of God in the ascension is the ability for us to achieve theosis and to be sons of God. So the ascension was required in that sense? Correct. Okay. Uh, I'll have to read more into that. So my second question would be, um, why did divinity bother with the Old Testament if it was all meant to foreshadow Jesus? Why not send Jesus as early as possible during the time of Adam? And then he could have taught all that was needed, died, and then was resurrected to start the new covenant. And then he could have ascended and done all the things you said before. What was the point of the Old Testament? Well, I think that in God's providence and infinite knowledge, he waited until the time was right, as Scripture says, to bring the uh, birth of the Messiah when humanity had been led to a certain stage. And so due to probably the effects of sin, humanity probably couldn't bear a lot of the truth and teachings and things that were um, that were brought about, for example, the time of Christ. Like you have the example of Alexander the Great spreading uh, Greek culture such that Koine Greek was everywhere. So providentially, Koine Greek was the means by which the message of the gospel spread throughout a lot of the empire at that time. And if you didn't have a, a language as an example, you know, if, if uh, Jesus had come at the time of Abraham, right, there's not a, a widespread language that would have uh, uh, been useful in that way. So God usually likes to use existing human providential things. So I think he also wanted to show and demonstrate a fulfillment of um, hundreds of prophecies as opposed to like if he had come the day of Abraham, there would have been like only a handful of prophecies. Uh, but rather by waiting a few millennia, <clears throat> you have hundreds of prophecies that are stacked up throughout the Bible that ended up being fulfilled. So it's another attestation to, you know, the Jesus being the Messiah. So there, there, and there might be other reasons that as humans finite, we don't even know. Sure, maybe, but my, um, I think my question was that, so basically, um, if he had appeared as early as possible during the time of Adam, that would have been, um, that would have been pre, um, that would have been pre-Babel, so everybody would have been speaking the same language, so I don't think that would have been a problem, and I feel like Jesus could have whoa, 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 told everything whoa. that was... <laughs> why do you think everybody, hold on, Every, <laughs> why, everybody is not speaking the same language, that's why Babel is confused, because at Babel, if, they, if, if Babel had been achieved, they would have spoken one language. So what do I you mean? Thought they spoke, I thought they were speaking one language while they were building Babel, and then God made them all have different Well, languages. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe they were, but my point is, like, Jesus... I mean, obviously, hold on. So, I, I see what you're saying. Right, but, so first thing is, Jesus actually is all over the Old Testament. He's the person talking to Abraham. He's the one who... Oh. He's the yeah, one who sure. uh, scrambled the languages at, uh, at uh, Babel. Mm-hmm. But wouldn't it have made more sense to incarnate during the time of Adam as early as possible? Well, but God I wanted... Mean, so one thing that the progressive revelation does is that it expands the uh, the call. So, for example, in Genesis, it's a family. And then by the time of Abraham, it's a tribe. And by the time of Moses, it's a nation. And then by the time of Christ, it's an empire that is global. So there's this gradual expansion uh, that I think 
shows the covenant is broadening and bringing more and more people into it. So for whatever reason, God wanted to gradually expand it. All right. And uh, my last question would be, what would be the best book on the introduction to Orthodox philosophy? Well, John Damascus's Fount of Knowledge is a classic uh, book that introduces it, but also uh, Yaroslav Pelikan's book, uh, uh, Christian, uh, uh, the, the one about uh, the Cappadocians and, and metaphysics, um, Christianity in the class, Christianity, the classical tradition, the metamorphosis of natural theology and the Cappadocians by Yaroslav Pelikan, P-E-L-I-K-A-N. Christianity and the classical tradition and... Yaroslav Pelikan, P-E-L-I-K-A-N. Okay. Because that will, that will teach you the terms of the Cappadocians. John Damascus' found of, of knowledge is really just kind of going through a bunch of Aristotelian philosophical terminology. Okay, and will it... And will, will that second book by Yaroslav, will that teach me all the terms as well? So things like theosis, mode, and like, because yes. you're using a lot of yes. terms that I don't really yes. understand. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good questions. <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate that. <clears throat> um, we'll do one or two more here. Jason? Got on mute. Hey, Jay. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Um, I noticed that in a debate, uh, when someone said it was silly to think that death entered because of the world, because of sin, because the first salad would have been death. But And I noticed that in your answer, you didn't say, well, in Christianity, life is in the blood. And I thought, oh, that was an easy one. We don't classify lettuce as being alive, but can can you talk about that a little bit? Well, that's just equivocating on the word alive, and so um, yeah, I think plants are alive. There's nothing wrong with saying plants are alive because plants die. If a plant dies, then it was alive, and all death entered as a result of the fall, including plant life. Okay, so that's the position that you take is that plant death occurs because of the fall. All death occurs because of the fall. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. And you do you don't take that position? Um I well I grew up Protestant and when I under my understanding of life, I thought they were eating salads in the Garden of Eden and like eating fruit and that is that No, the mode of existence the mode of existence prior to the fall is different than after the fall. That's why God says that he uh, killed an animal and made them skins. That's talking about our flesh, physical body that we have now. So the type of bodies that they had were not identical to the bodies that we have now. Understood. If you, read, awesome. if, you read, if you read Romans 8, it says that uh, all uh, death, uh, all entropy, all, you know, whatever, it's a result of the fall. Uh, Matt, what's up, Matt? Bean, Bean, Bean Man, two dollars. What do you think about Catholic social teaching? Subsidiarity, human dignity, common good. Where does it overlap with orthodoxy? Well, I mean, those are kind of, uh, you know, those are kind of vague phrases. So, do I believe in human dignity? Yeah, but not in uh, not on the same basis. Oh, okay. as, hold on, not on the same basis as the Roman Catholic uh, to base it on, uh, you know, natural uh, law can you with hear me, no. Jerry? Yes, just hold on a minute. <clears throat> Um, common good. I mean, common good is kind of a basic. Yeah, of course we believe in the common good, but that's also kind of a basic idea. So we'd have to be more specific. I just don't think that the Roman Catholic idea that all that is somehow uh, based on self-evident principles of natural law makes any sense. But um, probably a lot of the basic ideas we would agree with. Sure. Go ahead. What's your what's your uh, idea, Matt? Go ahead. Hi, Jay. I'm, I'm uh, currently Pentecostal, but I have been looking into orthodoxy. Okay. But I've just been struggling with, um, I suppose, that whole scripture and tradition. 
And I just wanted to put that the sacraments are, are actually outside the church as you're, well as inside the church. I'm not. You're cutting out, man. Sorry. Um, so. In terms of tradition, I would say, uh, you know, Paul talks about handing on the traditions as he delivered them in Corinthians. Uh, Paul talks about the oral and the written tra uh, traditions in Second Thessalonians. Um, you know, tradition is uh, just means what's handed down, right? So there's good traditions and there's bad traditions. The canon of Scripture itself is part of the church's tradition, like what books make it up. The Bible itself doesn't identify which books go into the canon, so... Uh, the church is necessary, tradition is necessary. So Jesus is refuting uh, traditions that replace what God says, not all tradition. Uriel, what's up? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hey, uh, so I'm a long-time listener, man. I was just wondering, I had a few questions. I, I Well, actually, let me say this. I, uh, I started rereading the Bible from the very beginning. Because I've been a long time believer in Christ, but I never really read the Old Testament, so I'm kind of going through it again, fully, mm. you know, as an as an adult. Mm. And uh, so, I just had a couple questions to see what you, you know, what you thought. Do you, do you have this. any disagreements? But today specifically about uh, disagreements. Oh no, I apologize. Man. It's okay. What What's your question? We'll make it quick. Okay. Um, well, I was just wondering. Um, so. The, a lot, a lot of the truther people who I don't know if they read the book, they always reference the fallen angels when they talk about the sons of God. Yeah. And I was wondering, like, what your take on that was, because how I understand it is that the sons of God would be Seth's bloodline, and um, yeah, I don't think there's any, there's not one orthodox position on this. You can believe in angels or Seth. I believe that. Uh, if you accept the Deuterocanon, there's about four places in the Deuterocanon where it specifies and makes it pretty clear that it is uh, titans or giants. Uh, so I've always believed in the angel view. Okay, cool. And then um, one more thing, if you could. who Do you think that Satan has, like, an actual identity? And if he does, like... What do you mean? Of course he's an angel. What do you mean? Well, okay, that's what I was wondering. I, I thought he was an angel, but, like, does he have another name and where does the name where does lucifer come from i hear a lot of people say lucifer but i don't see that connection well it's in isaiah 14 uh but does isn't that referencing a king it's comparing satan to the king and the king to satan interesting okay yeah, I mean, I guess it does I'll, this a lot uh i mean ezekiel 28 does the exact same thing where it compares uh another king to satan so the fall of a king is compared to the fall of the pride of lucifer so it's a both and not an either or interesting okay thanks man yeah good questions R reinhard what's up reinhard You gotta unmute, man. Guys, you gotta unmute. Reinhard, you gotta unmute if you wanna talk. Okay. Uh, don't. Eudaimonia. What's up? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, man? Yeah, right. Uh, so I don't. I know. I heard you say that uh, this is mostly for disagreements. I don't know if it's a okay. disagreement. Well, yeah. So everybody calls in on the day of disagreements and they don't disagree. What's up? <laughs> yeah, I know it's. Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not trying to be rude, but I want to go back to Reinhard because he might actually disagree. So day is for disagreements. Nobody ever calls in disagreements. Go ahead, Reinhard. Although, actually, we had a great conversation with a disagreeing Roman Catholic for like an hour or hour and a half. So, uh, I take that back. Most people don't. What's Yo, up? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Jay, I just wanted to ask, what unites in the hypostatic union? What are the things that unite? They unite Christ? What do you mean? 
No, at the union, right? What unites? Like when we speak of a union, we're speaking of two things that unite. Mm -hmm. What are those things with respect to Christ? Right. So the divine person who possesses a divine nature unites himself to a human nature. So it's the person uniting himself to the human nature. Correct. Because, yeah, because then I'm just wondering, because usually when we talk about a union, those two things become one after the union, right? So it's like an objection by, you know, the Orientals that I'm struggling with. So if we're saying that the person unites with the nature, what becomes one? That's why it's called the hypostatic union. And this is why even after the union in the two letters to Sixensis, Cyril talks about two natures. This is cleared up at the Fifth Council in yeah. uh, the word in hypostatic. So the human nature exists in the mode of the divine logos who assumed it. Yeah, I understand that the logos assumed the human nature, right? Okay, and what is the logos? Do you think the logos is just a divine nature or is he a person with a nature? No, the logos is the person of Christ. Okay, so then you affirm what I just said. <clears throat> Yeah, and I'm not I'm not taking a contrary stance. I'm just asking. I don't think that answered my question, respectfully, right? I think it did answer the question, but how did it no, not? No, what you said was that the Logos assumed the human nature, and that he exists within that human nature. Yeah, I understand. So it's in hypostatic. Do you know what that word means? Uh, in hypostatization? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, isn't that when the person assumes the nature, and then the nature subsists within the person? Well, but it also applies to the human nature that it exists yeah. in the mode of the logos that assumed it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I'm saying what became one after the union? I know that he assumed the human nature. I'm saying what became one? When two things unite, they become one. Yeah, but they become one in what way? It doesn't mean they become a tertium quid. Um, you could say numerically, I guess. Yeah, but this is an either or, right? So there, it's not a tertium quid. So the monophysite position is a tertium quid. And then what happened in the death? Sorry, what happened in the what? In the death. If it's a tertium quid, what happened in the death? Like, I don't understand what you're asking me. So you're not familiar with the common objections to the monophysite position, but you're trying to argue monophysitism. <laughs> I'm aware of the objections. What do you mean? Well, then you would be aware of what I just asked you. What happened in Christ's death? Oh, when, when Christ died, his human soul separated from his body. Okay, so he maintains a human nature and it's not a tertium quid. Yeah, yeah, the human nature doesn't go away when he dies. Okay, then you agree with the orthodox position. Yeah, like I said at the beginning, I agree with your position. That's still not answering my question. Uh, it is answering your question because something can be one in more than one way. So only if you have a reductionist idea of what one means, would you think that it's a tertium quid? Do you know what I mean by tertium quid? Okay, okay, that's fine, that's fine. You answer my question. Okay, that's fine. Well, do you know what a tertium quid means? No, what does that refer okay, to? Okay, so you've been answering and you don't even know what that means. But the concepts we're talking about, I'm familiar with. I mean, you can explain the word. I'll guarantee you I know what it means. Well, this is a common term in monophysite oriental disputes between Orthodox. Okay, explain the term. Well, you acted like you knew about it. <laughs> what have I gotten wrong? Well, you're in this giggling. Because <laughs> you're talking what do you about think this funny? word that's not English, right? So what? I understand the concept. Oh, okay. What do I? I, I still well, hold on. If you understand, more. if you understand the concept, what is it? Look, I'm saying you can explain the word and I'll know the concept. Well, you've already been sassy, being condescending and giggling at me. Like, this is like, I didn't answer I'm your question. because you think it's a gotcha to tell me this, like, non-English word. And tell, as if, like, I don't because understand. it shows that you don't actually know this dispute because you said you did. Yeah, so when, like, an English speaker knows what essence means. But yeah, but you, it doesn't difference. matter because you knew what, yeah, in, you, yeah. so you knew what in hypostaton was, but you don't know what so you tertium have to, quid like, means. you like, know Greek to read the Cappadocians, right? Tertium quid yeah. is not a Greek term, it's a Latin term. I know, it's an analogy. But anyways, Jay, thanks for answering my question. You answered it quite well. It was clearly and concise. Yeah, so these people... And you definitely specified what became one, right? So what is your position it's not exactly? Like you evaded the question to ask me questions. Right? right. So this is a newly made profile. So what's your real position? So you made this profile to come on the debate, right? Yeah, because I deleted Twitter. <laughs> I don't know why you keep giggling like this is some gotcha. I deleted Twitter. Uh huh. What's your point? So who are you really? Hey, I'm, I'm irrelevant. Here we go. Here we go. We're gonna keep repeating my name now. So this is a mute automatic block. <laughs> Well, if you're irrelevant, why are you, why are you, what, like, what is so funny? Like, I don't understand the, the logic of these people. Jay, Jay, you're 
Why do you keep repeating my name? Like, why do you do this? You guys are all the same. This is terrible. Your, your reasoning is horrible. That's why I'm laughing. My reasoning is horrible. Okay. Yeah. So you admitted that you admitted I answered your question, but the reasoning is horrible. <laughs> Exactly. So this is the, you see how he played this game and I can always immediately identify these people because they start giggling and they start uh, getting all sassy and they pretend like they're pious and then they start repeating my name. And uh, yeah, this guy's ridiculous. So he doesn't even know anybody who knows that dispute would know what the word tertium quid means. It means third thing. And he doesn't know that. So he doesn't actually know the basics of the dispute between Orientals and Orthodox. That's a classic. It doesn't mean you have to know the Latin. It means that you would know this dispute. And you notice how the fake piety all spilled. It eventually comes out. Hello. Yeah, what's up, man? Hello, Jay. I get to see you. Uh, I would like to ask about the uh, the one will in the Roman Catholic side of the filial play. Do you have any uh, objections to that or any? How does one will? What? How would that prove filial play? Uh, no, 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 not, not prove. Uh, because I'm um, new and I'm just starting to understand, and I understand the mostly the Eastern Orthodox side, but then when it comes to the Roman Catholic, there's an objection you made, if I'm not mistaken, if the... All right, uh, we're going to move on. I'm sorry, I don't under... <clears throat> I don't understand. We're going to move on. It's hard to understand what you're saying. Uh, today is for uh, people who disagree. Objections. Reformed. Here we go. We spent... Uh, Good bit of time refuting reform, uh, redeem Zoomer. Unmute, dude. Reformed man, unmute. Hello. Yep. What's up? Um, I'm reading a little bit about um, uh, the ontology of scripture. I've never really investigated the canon. And I was just wondering if what the Orthodox position is on the ontology of Scripture, and if like, well, if the canon is the canon is different from ontology. That's a historical question, so I don't know what you're talking about. Right. Well, the um, there's like in the Reformed literature, like that I'm reading, uh -huh. like Michael Kruger and stuff. They posit an ontological canon <laughs> that it's the speech of God. Yeah, that's called um, Nestorianism, right? So there's this like ethereal thing that is the word of God that's the canon of scripture but then there's this historical thing that's another thing right there's no such thing as a canon of scripture that is not the actual historical decision of the church so is it true that God knows the canon of scripture yes that's not an ontological canon that a reform reform person has access to <clears throat> outside of history right well I I mean they make arguments for that it coincides that it's a product of redemptive history um, How does that prove the can... Protestant canon? Because, the whole, again, it's bypassing the fact that the Reformed person has no access to who God is apart from the Bible, but the Bible is the thing in question. So it's a way for them to try to get around the necessity of the church in the decision of the canon. But there is uh, what, what access does a Reformed person have to the mind of God to get the canon? This is preposterous. Because when he starts talking about God, his presupposition is the canon, but that's the thing in question. Right. I guess I don't. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm new to these uh, the literature, so I was just. I don't really understand. It's just a made up thing to reform people to try to get a. It's. 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 It's presupposing the thing in question. Oh, I don't need to go to the historical church to get the canon because I have access to the God canon in the mind of God. No, you don't. Well, I think the the argument that I've come across is the. Um, the, the ontological canon is, or the way they the way they explain it is that the their kind of I guess thing they try to say as a defeater is that the speech of God constitutes the church and the church is a, a recipient of the canon but not the uh, 
doesn't give the give the speech. The speech of God is identified as the second person of the Godhead, the Logos. So you right. could say you could say the church is a uh, bearer of God's word and a manifestation of the body of the Logos. Sure. But none of that in any way gets around the historical fact that the church determined the canon within history. I mean, even James White admitted this in his debate with Trent. Right. Well, that's the thing. That's what I guess I'm confused about because the Reformed scholars... Okay. Let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. How does positing any of that tell you what books go in the Bible? Um, that's a good question. I'm not yeah, it really doesn't. Sure. It doesn't do that. So it's just another way to try to assume the Protestant canon. Interesting. So what, what's the, uh, is there like a book that I could read to help understand? Yeah, like I would read two Protestant books history. on this. I would read uh, Lee McDonald's book, The Formation of the Christian Biblical Canon, and I would read F.F. F. Bruce's book, The Canon of Scripture, and you'll see two uh, Protestant scholars basically admitting the centrality of tradition. So that was the thing that convinced me back in the day of this, uh, this point. But thank you, Reformed Buzzard. Appreciate that. Lewis. Lewis. Hey, Jay. Yo. Yo, I just wanted to ask, um, with regards to the Trinity, um, I'm an Orthodox Christian, by the way, but um, we say that there is one will in the Trinity, so the Father, Son, Holy Spirit share one will, mm -hmm. or they have the same will. Um, but then, I'm quite new to Orthodox theology, actually, so when the Father sends the Spirit, for example... How does that work? So, because isn't the father willing for for himself to send the spirit? And so, is the spirit willing that as well? I don't, I don't understand how it works. Yeah. So, will is a common faculty or property that exists in the mode of the persons that have it. So, there's not three wills. There's one will, but that one will is had in the tropos or the mode of the three persons that have it. So, uh, yes, each each person uh, uh, actualizes, you could say, the one action in a unique role or in a unique mode. So the father sends the son, uh, for example, the father sends the son to become incarnate, son becomes incarnate, and then the, the son sends the Holy Spirit to the church. So that one action of redemption is triadic, and, but it's executed, you could say, in the mode of the three persons that have that one action. So um, we have to distinguish person, nature, essence, or, or excuse me, person, nature, will, and energy, and mode. So people oftentimes forget mode as a very important Trinitarian distinction. So what you're looking at is the difference between the property or faculty of nature and the mode of that property, which is in the mode of the person. So it's even though person, even though will is not a property of nature, it exists in the mode of the person that has the nature. I wait. I see. So did you, what did you just say? Um, will is not a property of nature. No. Will is a property of nature, but exists in the okay. mode of person that has the nature. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, then. Um, yeah, okay, that's fine. That answers it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good questions. Those, those are those are really... Yeah, just remember that uh, a mode is just as important for Trinitarian theology as, uh, you know, any of the other terms like, uh, uh, you know, energy, essence, nature, mode is just as important. Uh, K-H-F-F. Now, this is for people that disagree. So we're going to have like one person that disagreed today. And that one uh, snarky soy monophysite guy they called in. Hello, Jay. Can you hear me? Yep. Hey, Jay. I was just wondering, um, as far as the EP goes... Okay, uh, do you have any disagreements? Or, or this is about... No. Okay, that's... No, Come on, bro. Have a good one, Jay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to be mean to you. Don't get mad at me and say I'm, I'm not being mean to you. Specifically said many times, today is for people who disagree. It's not about EP and all that. Mercurius, what's up? Unless you have a disagreement about that topic or something. That Roman Catholic guy thought that the EP was a good argument. Go ahead. Got to unmute. Oh, hi, Jay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Jay, um, I was watching your debates with uh, Matt Delahunty and whatever. Would you say that atheism is impossible? Uh, logically impossible? Like, no, when we say the word impossible, we mean like, uh, 
like when we say atheism is impossible, right? We would say that entails a contradiction. Yeah, you know, we've already addressed this like multiple times. So did you just want to repeat the argument? It's a metalogic, metalogical argument. Go ahead and address it. Right. Well, I've addressed it many times, but your That's argument, good. your argument rests. It rests on the what argument. The argument that you're going with, I already know this is Jay Mike's argument. The argument rests on the assumption that everything is, you're not going to let me finish. So it's a first, okay, go ahead, it's go not ahead. a first, or, right? So the argument is about the possibility of logic at all, not a first order logic argument. Okay. That's the addressing of your objection. What's my objection? That the proposition or that the belief in atheism does not entail a contradiction. That's where you're arguing. Right. That's not what I said. That's that's the I, argument that you guys make, I said right? Atheism, not the belief in it. Okay, so now you're now you want to haggle over words. No, it's not haggling. It's actually it is haggling. You're haggling over words, and yeah, I've I already addressed this many times. Addresses metallurgical questions. That's fine. I understand that. Okay, but the thing is that you're also making the other claim, right? The first order logic claim that atheism is impossible logically, which would mean that it has to entail. You don't even know what it means in terms of justification. Like who who's out there? of us thinking it doesn't entail a contradiction. Okay, so what's the contradiction? The contradiction is if the, deni the denial or the non-acceptance of the necessary condition for the possibility of knowledge, um, <clears throat> what you're doing is you're both affirming that and denying that condition at the same time. That's a contradiction. Well, hold on, hold on. That would just be a contradiction in the beliefs of the said person, which I just addressed. Right. Even if I was to take that as true, that would just mean that one person. No, the lack of a sense. Hold up, hold up. That would just mean that one person has contradictory beliefs. I'm talking about the worldview of atheism. And right? I just, I just said that. Yeah, you, you said you, that. You changed the, the subject. Have, now now he's changing the subject person. to an individual atheist, as if it's not addressing the actual claim. This is so yeah, This is like me saying atheism is impossible because Jay Dyer has some contradictory position. I never no, said that. Sir. That's Kramer that's not what we're arguing. Yeah, no, that's exactly what you said. No, it's not. But it is. He said that some person. This is the reason it applies to everybody is because it's prior to argumentation. Because it's a metallurgical argument, it's about the possibility of logic at all. That's okay, the point. Look, look, look. That applies to any. Like, that applies to any position. Objection. That yeah, applies to any position. Yeah, that's fine. So, Ananias or whatever. Okay, so that presupposes that knowledge is even possible. How would this go through on an epistemological nihilist? Do you think we haven't addressed that? Do you know how many times epistemological well, nihilists have call, called in? We've, we've addressed it in the past. Just address the well, no, stuff. no, because we've, if we've already addressed, this isn't even, is this even your position or are you just coming out with other positions? This isn't your position. No, no Jay, look, you, you try to understand what I'm saying. Listen closely. I said, I know what epistemic through. nihilism is. We've had them call in many yeah, times. Yeah, I didn't say you don't know what it is. So my, maybe just try to listen. I said, how would this go through on an epistemic nihilist? That's not to say that I am one. You take it to a second order level yeah. statement about epistemic nihilism. So epistemic nihilism does not uh, accomplish what they want it to do because there's a second order, there's a third order that you, they don't get out of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they do, and this is why, right? You said that the reason that it would be contradictory is because the atheist is going to have to affirm something about the necessity or like the necessary preconditions for the intelligibility of knowledge right the intelligibility of mathematics logic all that stuff but an epistemic nihilist would just deny the existence of those things yeah and so now you can't make sentences so now you can't make arguments you guys are over talking so now you can't make arguments or sentences we've heard it a thousand times that's why because it's been addressed a thousand times yeah so what do you what do you you want to be like I don't, yeah, I don't get it. Okay, so can you just address it instead of saying you've addressed it? Yeah, the addressing is that if you adopt that position, you can't make arguments you anymore. I say, yeah, yeah. I, 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 no, I'm talking to you now. This is my, this is my thing. I'm talking to you now and I'm addressing it by telling, go ahead, sir. I'm addressing it by telling you that if you adopt that position, you can no longer argue or make sentences at all. And if you want to, and if you want to do that, then you, then you, then that's fine. Then the then you have to drop yeah, the mic. No, Jay. The thing is, the per, the epistemic nihilist could just agree to all those conditions. It still wouldn't. Right. So then, wrong. so then we've won. Then we've won the debate, and and they can't. If they listen, if you can't make sentences, all right. I'm boot. If you're gonna, if you don't shut up, I'm booting you. Shut up, or I'm booting you. Shut up, or I'm booting you. I know. I know you want an excuse to boot me. That's fine. <clears throat> Okay, 
Yeah, so we've addressed this probably the episode 30 times. doesn't get out of does You don't get out of it because you say, I don't accept anything. This is so dumb. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's epistemic import in making those second order statements about their epistemic nihilism that they're not assenting to something. Yeah, J, J. Mike is so low tier, he doesn't even understand that adopting a position where you don't believe in logic doesn't get you anywhere in a debate. <laughs> I mean, that's it's so obvious. It's so crazy. What would you say to this, Father Deacon? Somebody says, well, but I don't, I don't believe in logic or any of your positions, and therefore you can't prove Christianity. Well, first of all, you're making a second order statement, right. an epistemic statement. Um, third point that I wanted to make, and I just addressed this in my paper, is you get them to admit some type of like epistemic deflationary position. I'm not in a position to know, okay? What do they do? They immediately slip back in um, <clears throat> their epistemic stuff that they want that they just denied to say, well, that doesn't prove, oh, wow, now you're making another epistemic statement. Notice all the epistemic statements he was saying, well, that doesn't include a contradiction, and that doesn't work for this. That doesn't do, well, wait a minute, I thought you just admitted you're not in a position to make any statements, epistemic statements. Right. So you want to see a contradiction? That's exactly a contradiction. And furthermore, the contradictions entailed, and I'll say a couple things because you're correct too to point out, the contradictions entailed and not a belief that you have, but the lack of assenting right. to the necessary conditions while at the same time assuming the necessary conditions. Right. This is why Van Til says there is no atheist. Right. There's just those that deny God. So that's a contradiction. But my final point that I want to make is the point that you were making about so this is a metalogical, metapistemological uh, consideration. What comes first epistemically, the necessary conditions that make uh, contradictions normatively binding as far as leading to falsehood or the contradiction itself? Notice what they want to do. They want to put contradiction is the first epistemic standard first epistemic principle right and then try to reduce everything to that while we're pointing out that well wait a minute what why should i think that's a justification i've addressed this in my paper before too all contradiction means is at at that level it from their worldview i can't do this psychologically without this happening yeah it certainly doesn't say it's a it's a normative um that you ought to or that it's binding on us, that it leads to falsehood or any, um, or the rejection of a, a contradiction leads to knowledge and truth. So they fail to grasp the meta logical, meta epistemological question. Yeah. What stands behind there that makes the avoidance of contradiction normatively binding on us, or that contradiction leads to falsehood? They'll never be able to answer it. They'll say, oh, I don't know. I don't have to answer that. Why? Well, slip it all back in and pretend that I've already have an answer for it. So it's totally disingenuous um, and self-refuting. Yeah, he just repeats this uh, over and over and over as, like, as, as if the, the rep repetition will like make it somehow true. All right, thank you guys so much. If you would, hit like and share. It's been a lot of fun. Um, be sure and head on over to uh, the supporters of the show and the stream. And I will... Catch you guys later. Get uh, tickets to the